Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson Dramatised by Yvonne Antrobus Yorkshire pudding's like firewood, Utterson. It warms you twice. Once when you eat it, and once when you walk it off. <laughs> we do seem to have come further than usual. Wait a minute. This courtyard. I've been here before. Well, there's a market here during the week, isn't there? It's very popular, I gather. Now, that's not what I mean. You see that door in the old warehouse? Grim-looking place. I'm surprised they haven't knocked it down. Doesn't exactly sit well amongst all the fresh paint and polished brass around it. It reminds me of a very unpleasant incident. I was walking home in the early hours. I'd been cleaned out of cards. Black winter it was, with nothing to be seen but iron lamps. Street after street of them. All lined up as if for a procession which no one had come to. And all around echoing like a church. I got to the point where I began to long for the sight of a policeman. And then... I saw two figures. One, a man, walking fast, very fast. And the other, a child, uh, a girl of about nine, running, running from the opposite direction. And... Out of my way! No, no please, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, don't, don't hurt me. Don't, don't. My father's ill. I had to go for the doctor. What do I care? No. Hey! Hey, you, sir. Have you gone mad? No. Have you... The child ran into me. No harm done. No harm? Are you all right? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You monster. I saw you kicking. Oh, you was kicking my child. Yeah, don't try and deny it. We saw you. Are you all right? Yes, I just... Yeah, so, you're the sort that enjoys kicking kiddies. I wonder if the boot was on the other foot. It's yeah, you like cowards. Yes, how you not being kicked in the guts. Ma please, please, madam. Please, all of you. Sir, I suggest you offer the child's mother some reparation. And if I don't, I shall make such a scandal that your name will stink all over London. Your threats don't impress me. Well, well how about some action, then? Yes, yeah, let's get... Them. Wait. If you will choose to make capital out of an accident, how much? One hundred pounds. That's not reparation. It's extortion. One hundred pounds. All right. Thank you, sir. Right, if you'll excuse me. Hey, where's he going? Uh, sir! Don't ask me to believe that this is where you left. I don't ask anything of you or if, of anyone. If you plan to escape through here, then let me... You do it. want your money, don't you? Well, it's not my money, but... but yes. Then let me get it. I suppose he don't come out again. I'll keep an eye on him. I suppose neither of them come out again. When's the doctor getting here? In the morning, he said... He'd have come quicker if he knew we had 100 pounds. Here you are. Ten sovereigns. And a cheque for the rest from Coots drawn payable to the bearer. Uh, but the signature, this is not your name. It's quite genuine. You mean, you just walk through a door at four in the morning, come out with another man's cheque, and ask me to believe it's not a forgery? All right. I'll stay with you until the bank's open and cash it myself. I invited him to spend the rest of the night at my chambers, together with the child's mother, and we all went to Coote's first thing. I handed in the cheque, saying I suspected its validity. But not a bit of it. The signature was genuine. Whose was it? That's almost the worst bit. A very distinguished man. Not just that, a good man. Well known for works of charity and... So you don't want to tell me his name? It's just that... The check was obviously the result of blackmail, payment for some youthful indiscretion. This drawer, it leads to what used to be the old dissecting room. Does it? Yes, I just realised, and it must back onto the garden of one of the houses in the square on the corner. Are you sure? But the square's so... Respectable. You were right not to tell me the name of the man who wrote the check. You don't, by any chance, know the name of the man who attacked the child. Hyde. Edward Hyde. Can you describe him? I'm not sure. This sounds strange, but when I think about him, I can't remember any of his features. Only that there was something wrong. In what way? He was deformed. I, I don't mean physically, not some misfortune. No, no. This was something you couldn't see, something twisted, something repellent. 
I've never met a man I dislike so much, and not just because of his treatment of the child. And he let himself in here with a key? Yes. Richard, I believe I know the name on the check. Because I've had a key. Thank you, Susan. Mom? Right, then. Where are you going? To my study. You're not by any chance trying to avoid another beating at chess. <laughs> nothing could be further from my mind. Since you got back from your walk, nothing could have been further than your mind. Your cousin's gambling. Is it to do with that? What? I'm right. You look as though you've seen a ghost. No, Lucy, you're wrong. I've just seen a case in a new light. Richard particularly enjoyed the Yorkshire pudding, by the way. In the case of my decease, all my possessions are to pass into the ownership of my friend, Edward Hyde. In the case of my disappearance, the said Edward Hyde shall take over all my responsibilities and all my rights without delay. Signed, Henry Jekyll, M.D., D.C.L., etc., etc. John? I'm just going round to see Lanyon. At this time of night? A couple of questions for him. I need his medical expertise. then passed out cold on the other side to be picked up by the porters in the morning. <laughs> uh, hmm. You didn't come to talk about college friends, did you? Well, in a way, I did. You and I must be the two oldest friends Henry Jekyll has. I don't care for the word old, but I see very little of him these days. Really? I thought both being doctors... Well, that's just it. Jekyll began to get fanciful... Talking nonsense, scurrilous nonsense. Unscientific. Well, if that's all... Don't make light of it. This was not just provocative talk, it was dangerous talk. Unethical. What did he say? Oh. He was obsessed with what he called man's dual nature. The struggle between good and evil. He said, with some disdain, how most of us settle eventually in favour of the good. With him, though, of course, it was different. The two sides of his character were so powerful that they could not be tamed. He seemed to take some pride in this, as though it made him superior to the rest of us. He even let me know that he had regularly given in to the dissolute side of his nature. Oh, he is a bachelor. He boasted of it, prancing about the room. Mm. Anyway, he'd come to the conclusion that in order for titans like him to live to their full potential, a scientific solution must be found. And? He was apparently engaged in some laboratory studies leading towards the mystic and transcendental. Don't ask me what he meant by that. I said his talk was fanciful. Did you ever meet a protege of his, Edward Hyde? Hyde? No, never heard of him. Right. In that case... What? If he be Mr. Hyde, then I shall be Mr. Seek. It's him. Come on. Mr. Hyde. What do you want? I see that you're letting yourself into this building. I'm an old friend of Dr. Jekyll's, John Artisan, solicitor. He must have mentioned me. Since this leads through to his garden, I thought you might let me in, too. Dr. Jekyll is not at home. Will you do me a favor? Will you let me see your face? So? Thank you. Now I shall know you again. And I you. Perhaps you should have my address as well, since you are a solicitor, my card. Thank you. Then should you hear something to my advantage? Well, I can't imagine that... How did you know me? Well, Dr. Jekyll... Never. Oh, please. You're a liar. That's no way to speak to... Liar. 
But Dr. Jekyll is my oldest friend. If I... he told you about me, then he's a liar, too. You're both liars. Bloody liars. Mr. Utterson. It's late, I know, but is Dr. Jekyll at home? I will see. Please, come in, sir. Okay. Will you wait here by the fire, or, or shall I give you a light in the drawing room? Here is fine, thank you, Paul. Pleasantest room in London, I always used to say. The stone flags, the oak cabinets, the carved walking stick I gave him. Yes, sir. I didn't notice the menace flickering in the polished wood, the crawl of shadows hanging like cobwebs from the ceiling. Tonight there is a shudder in my blood. Even the walking stick looks like a weapon. The sight of Hyde seems to have infected my spirit, distorting everything. I am afraid Dr. Jekyll has gone out, sir. Ah, yeah, I saw Mr. Hyde come in by the old dissecting room door. Is that all right when the doctor is not at home? Uh, quite all right, sir. Uh, Mr. Hyde has a key. Your master seems to put a lot of trust in him. Indeed. We have orders to obey him. I don't think I've ever been introduced to Mr. Hyde. Oh, he, he never dines here, sir. We see little of him on this side of the house. Check. Yeah, I didn't see that coming. Well, only putting off the evil hour. Have you seen anything of Henry Jekyll lately? You know my intentions before I know them myself. Checkmate. Oh. What sort of trouble is it that Henry's in? Why do you think he's in any sort of trouble? He might be ill. If he were ill, you would have told me. You would have gone visiting with a bottle of best single malt under your arm. Lucy, do you ever feel burdened by all the things you've done wrong? Or things that you can't put right? <laughs> no, of course you don't. You're a wonderful woman. You wouldn't know what I was talking about. It's your goodness that makes you say that. Forgetting all about my failure to get on with your mother, my untidiness, my exasperation if we lose at cards. But no, I don't feel burdened. You are, of course, talking about Henry. He was quite wild when he was young. I'm not sure that he's ever repented. On the other hand, I don't think he'd care for his behaviour to become the subject of gossip now. Shakespeare had words for it. Shakespeare had words for most things. Reputation, reputation, reputation. Mm -hmm. From a Oh, I have lost my reputation. Mm -hmm. I have lost that immortal part of myself. And what remains is bestial. Go, John. Go and see him now. Well, this is good. This is splendid. I can't tell you how relieved I am that you approve of this claret. I've just bought six cases of the stuff. Mighty rash of me. What would I have done, my dear old friend, if you had pronounced it undrinkable? Jekyll, I think we should talk seriously. About... This is serious. Good God, I'd have had to pack it all up in the hansom, gallop across London and throw the lot in the Thames. About your will? Oh, no, not that. But I was by the Thames the other day and I saw a raven. I thought it was a black seagull. Then I took note of the flapping. Seagulls don't flap. They glide. Must have escaped from the tower. Now, what if all the other ravens took it into their heads to do the same? We must lock them all up at once, or else sit back and watch the monarchy topple. Does this Mr. Hyde know he is to inherit? What? I'm concerned he might grow impatient. Poor John. I've never seen anyone get so upset about my little notions. Unless it's that pedant, Lanyon, with his outrage at what he calls my scientific heresies. I don't think... Oh, he's a good enough fellow. There's no need to frown like that. But I do find him insufferably self-righteous. You know, I never approved of it. My will? No, I do know that. You told me so at the time. Well, I'm telling you again. I've been learning things about young Mr. Hyde. I thought we'd agreed to let the matter drop. What I learned was appalling. What you learned was irrelevant. My position is... Well, it's a very strange one. 
Nothing can be resolved by talking about it. Henry, don't you know by now that you can trust me? Of course. I trust you. More than myself. That's the truth. If only I could tell you. But it's really not as bad as you imagine. Any moment I choose, I can be rid of Edward Hyde. So can we just forget about the will? If you wish. Just one more thing I'd like you to understand. Yes? I take a paternal interest in poor Hyde. I know that you've met him, and I'm afraid he was rude to you. But I do know something of his circumstances, and uh, I worry about him if anything were to happen to me. You're not here, No, 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 no. I... Just promise me that if, if I were taken away... But, Henry... That you would look after his interests and make sure he gets what's due to him. I can't pretend that I can ever like him. I don't ask that. I only ask that you help him when I am no longer here. Oh, a full moon. It's like breathing with the earth. Peace shining everywhere. <laughs> Good evening. Mm. Sir, excuse me. Glorious evening, in fact. And so late in October. Perhaps the last that we shall see. The moonlight catches the water like... It's at moments like this I wish I were a poet. How about you, sir? What? young man like you, I'm sure you write poetry. I have better things to do. Good night. Can there be a better thing than to express the beauty of God's creation? God is nothing but an invention. An instrument of repression used by pedants to stop the rest of us from living true to our natures. Your experiences have been sad ones, I'm sorry. But God's forgiveness is infinite. Now save your superstition for yourself. You should be in your grave. <coughs> Left to rot! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Inspector. This is the body of Sir Danvers Carew. I was afraid so. But as to motive... Robbery? His purse and gold watch were still in his pockets, along with a letter addressed to you, Mr. Utterson. He was a client of mine. I imagine he just slipped out to post it. He could have waited. A routine matter. Such a frenzied attack. It suggests revenge, hatred. Oh, Sir Danvers hadn't an enemy in the world. I should like to speak to the young maidservant who witnessed the crime. Everything touched with silver. I, I've never felt more at peace. Never thought more kindly about all the people on the earth. And this old gentleman, his hair was silver too. That's what he was saying, as though he was speaking my thoughts for me. And I can't believe it, this creature. He was shrunken, you say. <laughs> shrunken with wickedness. Mm. And drunk, maybe, or, or mad, I, I don't know. He, he just exploded like a great ball of anger, kicking in and hitting the old man with his stick as though he had to beat all the goodness out of him. This stick, you have it here. What's left of it? It's quite unusual, all that carving around the handle. Hide. He must have stolen it. Who? I gave this to uh, to a friend, oh, some 20 years ago. I think I can take you to the thief's house. Yes? We wish to speak with Mr. Hyde. This is where he lives? It is where he lives, yes. It is important. He isn't here. He came back last night very late and he was gone again in less than an hour. I see. No, you don't. 
I hadn't seen him for two months till yesterday. Then may we see his rooms? <laughs> no, you may not. This is Inspector Newcomb of Scotland Yard. Oh, is he in trouble? I knew it. Unusual for a man to ransack his own home. He lived in some style for a common criminal. Almost as though someone else had arranged the place for him. This painting of the Thames, I remember... Don't tell me, it's another thing you gave to your friend. Like the stick? No, but I've seen it before. Talking of the stick? Oh, what I found? The other half of it. And over here... See, he's tried to burn the evidence. But not quite succeeded. His checkbook? He must really have lost his head. What's a man going to do without money? Tell me what he looks like. I'm not sure that I can. It was months ago. All I have is an impression... That'll do. ...of deformity. No, not physical. Of evil. That's not exactly a description, sir. This mutual friend, perhaps he could be... No, some... no, I don't think so. Dr. Jekyll was already in the laboratory when we got up this morning, and he's been there all day. There's a door at ground level, isn't there, that opens onto a street market? Yes, sir. Thank you, Paul. Henry! Henry! Henry. No. Not ill. Just, uh... My dear old friend. How the sight of you always cheers me. You've heard about Sir Danvers? The newspaper sellers were crying it in the square. Sir Danvers Carew was my client, but so are you. Tell me you've not been mad enough to shelter the man who killed him. John, how could you think such a thing? I'm finished with Hyde forever. Oh, thank God. He doesn't even want my help. I hope you're right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. There won't be a trial. I have grounds for knowing that, but I can't share them with you. There is something, though, on which you may be able to give me professional advice. I received this letter today and don't know whether to show it to the police or not. You're worried it might incriminate him? No, I don't care what becomes of Hyde. I was thinking of my own reputation. Dr. Jekyll, whom I have so unworthily repaid... Gone where no one will ever find me. Your good name secure. Signed, Edward Hyde. Well, that puts a better colour on things. Have you the envelope? Uh, I burned it. But it had no postmark. The letter came by hand. Shall I keep this, then? I want you to decide everything for me. I've lost all confidence in myself. Was I right in thinking that it was Hyde who dictated the terms of your will? He planned to murder you, Henry. Don't you realise what an escape you've had? Escape? <laughs> yes. And a lesson. Oh, God, John. I'm so sorry. Good night, sir. Good night, Paul. Oh, um, by the by, a letter was handed in today. Can you remember what the messenger looked like? Nothing came today, sir, except by post. And only circulars at that. I can't stop thinking about poor Sir Danvers. The man who did it, I suppose he was under the influence of alcohol or some drug. He'd have to be mad in some way. You think so? I have a letter here from a Mr. Hyde. There. The signature of a murderer. Tell me what you think. Well, not mad, but very strange. Immature. Come in. Oh, thank you, Griffiths. Sir. Well, there's a surprise. Who's it from? Henry Jekyll. A dinner invitation. 
Are we free the Saturday before Christmas? Well, I do hope so. It always used to be such fun. Gertie, what is it? Look. The invitation and the letter. Henry's writing is upright. The murderer slopes backwards. But in every other point, the two signatures are identical. You save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Old tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. Old tidings of comfort and joy. <laughs> What a good evening. I can't remember when I last saw Henry in such form, just like the old days. There is, yes, a new lightness about it. Now, Henry, you promised. No, 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 yes, no. Yes, you did. You promised you'd give us a soda. Yes, <laughs> no, no, no. Come on, Henry. Oh, all right. Yes. All right, all right. Just one. Yes. Uh, a song from my childhood. Oh, yes. We used to spend our summers in the Scottish Highlands. <clears throat> Ye banks and braes, O oh bonny doon, how can ye bloom so fresh and fair? How can ye chant ye little birds? Happy Christmas! Christmas. Happy Christmas! Christmas. Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Don't forget to wish him a happy new year from me. I will, of course. Although it hardly seems necessary. I've never seen Jekyll in such good spirits. Did Susan give you the two jars of marmalade to take to him? Yes, yes. Cook's only just made it. Henry loves her marmalade. Something to look forward to when he gets back from his early morning walk. He's actually taken his own advice and walks everywhere now. He says he enjoys it as much for the people he gets to talk to as for the exercise. Morning, Paul. I'm sorry, Mr. Utterson. The doctor is busy today. I trust I've called at a more convenient time. Sir, I am afraid Dr. Jekyll is indisposed. I do hope the doctor is feeling better. My master has told me to say that he is seeing no one. <laughs> Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends, and although we may have differed on scientific questions, there was never a day when if you had said to me, Jekyll, my life, my honour, my reason depend on you, I would not have sacrificed everything I have. Dear Lanyon, Although we may differ over scientific questions, you must believe that on this very subject, I trust you as no one else. That is why, labouring under the deepest darkness of spirit, I ask you for help that no one else... <laughs> My dear Lanyon, out of the depths, I appeal to you for the love of God. Only you can help. Lanyon, I'm sorry for calling uninvited. I'm worried about... But you look tired. I'll come back another time. I wouldn't do that. You'd likely be too late. It's my heart. I've had a shock. You should be there. No. no. I need to stay alert. <clears throat> what is it you came to tell me? That Jekyll is also ill. I wondered if you'd heard from him. I don't wish even to hear his name. What is this? Ask him. Oh, he won't see me. There you are. One day you'll learn the rights and wrongs of it. By then I shall be dead. Ah, life was pleasant. I liked it, yes. 
Now I know that if we saw the darkness at the center of every smile, we should be glad to go. Henry, thank you. Your letter, how could I refuse? Marmalade. <laughs> From Lucy. How kind of you both. Uh, there's a chair somewhere under those papers. Oh. I wrote out of concern for you and for Lanyon. Uh, that quarrel is incurable. I shall not see him again. Nor... John, you mustn't doubt our friendship if I don't see much of you either. I must be left alone to go my own way. This is depression talking. No. Henry, what's happened to you? I was born, perhaps. And to every advantage. Rich, naturally studious, with a deep desire for approval. Privilege can be a burden to someone who takes its obligations too much to heart. I had this fault, you see. A certain impatient gaiety. You were only a boy. It mocked everything I knew was required of me. It was your innocence, Henry. I learned to hide it behind a solemn demeanour. Perhaps that was a greater fault. I grew up with a morbid sense of shame and the awareness of being two totally different people. You mustn't blame yourself. I don't, now. In fact, now I know that if I had had the courage to express my true character when young, I would have saved myself and those around me from torment. When I left home for university, I used this hidden personality to indulge in less than innocent pleasures, meanwhile maintaining strict religious observance. Your friends loved you. <laughs> Which one? The man that spent drunken nights with prostitutes? Or the hypocrite? I never had any friends. How can anyone be my friend if they don't know who I am? Do you really think we'd condemn you for a few wild nights? Can't you see that it's the exacting nature of my aspirations, rather than any extremes of appetite, that have made me what I am? A soul divided. I'm no less myself when I plunge into the darkest excesses than when I work to relieve suffering. And my studies confirm the truth that man is not one, but two. My dream was to separate these warring elements within myself each housed in different identities. But how? Then a light began to shine upon the problem from the laboratory table. Certain elements, I discovered, had the power to shake and to pluck back the fleshly clothing. I could be free to be whichever one I wanted, free from restraint, free from guilt. You are ill, Henry. I knew that even if I could make such a drug that by taking it I might risk death. And yet, I had waited so long for release. So, once I had prepared my tincture, I bought a large quantity of a certain salt from a wholesale chemist, the final ingredient. And you took the drug? Yes, I took it. And? As you say, I am ill, poisoned. Is there no antidote? Only time. They say time heals all things. We commend to Almighty God our brother, hasty Charles Lanyon, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's sad not to see Henry Jekyll here. He's still unwell. But only a week ago, you were saying... John, what's the matter? Lanyon has left me a letter. I buried one friend. I fear that its contents could cost me another. Private, for the hands of J.G. Utterson alone. Not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Disappearance? Well, it seems Mr. Hyde has gone for good. Wish I could be so certain. Perhaps he... 
<laughs> you think he might appear out of thin air? No, no, I, I was thinking about Jekyll. He spends all his time up there in his laboratory. To see a friend might do him good. Oh, there he is, at the window. <laughs> like a prisoner in a tower. Jekyll! How are you? You spend too much time indoors. You should be out in the fresh air. Whip up the circulation. Hey, come on, get your hat and take a quick turn with us. I should love to, but I don't take the risk. It's good to see you, John. I, I should like to ask you both out, but the place isn't fit. Oh, my cousin, by the way, Richard Enfield. We've met. I don't think so. No, we have. I remember your face. It was... Where? No, no. I'm wrong. I, I, I've never seen you before. Jekyll, what is it? No, please, no. Don't worry, we'll come up. No, don't. Don't. Pawn to King Four. Ah. There. Would you like that move again? What? Pawn to Queen's Rook 4. You want me to take the centre? Oh. Yes. John, this was meant to take your mind off whatever you... What was that? What's going on? Paul, this is hardly the way... Sir, f forgive me. John, yeah. can't you see he's upset? Is it Dr. Jekyll? Yes. You know... How he shuts himself up. He's been like that for a week now. I don't like it. Be explicit. What don't you like? I haven't seen him to speak to. Not at all. Not since he asked me to take the cheval mirror from the blue bedroom up to the laboratory. What are you on that for? I have no idea. I'm frightened, sir. Very frightened. There's been foul play. What? By whom? Gently, Mr. Paul. Try and tell us. I daren't, Mum. But if you come with me, Mr. Utterson, you will see for yourself. Oh, God, then there'd be nothing wrong. Oh, then, Paul. Let us in. Is that you, Paul? Yes, yes. What are you all doing here? Your master would not be pleased. That's right. <clears throat> be quiet, girl. Sir, if you'll come with me. As quiet as you can, sir. He's up there. See, his shadow against the light. If he asks you to step inside, don't go. But why? Mr. Utterson, sir. Asking to see you. Tell him. I can't see anyone. Was that my master's voice? It seems changed. Changed? I should say so. Dr. Jekyll's been murdered. A week ago, we heard him cry out to God for mercy. And now his killer's taken up residence in there. Pacing the floor night and day. What on earth could persuade the killer to stay? It doesn't make sense. All this last week, whatever it is that lives in there has been crying out for medicine. It was always Dr. Jekyll's way to write his orders on a piece of paper and leave it on the stairs. Well, this past week, we've had nothing but notes and a closed door. These orders, what has he asked you to do? Oh, I've been sent flying off to every wholesale chemist in town. And whenever I bring the stuff back, there'll be another bit of paper telling me to return it. Then another order. He's desperate for some drug. Do you happen to have one of these notes? Yeah, here. The man at Moore's threw it back at me, like so much rubbish. Dr. Jekyll reiterates that the last sample is impure. Dr. J originally purchased a large quantity from Mrs. Moore. He now begs them to make a search. For God's sake, find me some of the old. 
It's as though he lost control of the pen, but this is certainly the doctor's writing. I've seen him. Seen who? The murderer. I'd just come into the dissecting room from the garden. He must have slipped out to see if his drug had arrived. When I came in, he gave a, a, a kind of cry and, and whipped back upstairs. It was only a moment, but my hair stood up like quills. Paul, are you saying that you recognised him? You mean, was it Mr Hyde? Then yes. Did you ever meet him? Once. So you will know that the sight of him brought a chill to your bones. And when this creature jumped out from the shadows, there was that feeling running down my spine like ice. I know it's not evidence, but I'd swear on the Bible it was Mr Hyde. All right, I believe you. I believe poor Henry has been murdered. So... Let our name be vengeance, because I intend to break down the door. I'm with you, sir. Jekyll, I demand to see you. We suspect a crime has been committed, and if you don't open the door, we shall break it down. For God's sake, have mercy! That is not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's. Come on, Poole. Down with the door. <coughs> Again! Let go, Paul. But, sir! Yeah. Now. Henry? You don't recognize me. I thought not, but... My two selves, I flicker between them. Soon, both will be free. What do you mean? The experiment I told you about, the special salt, I added it. The chemicals erupted. I stood watching them as they boiled and smoked. Then I picked up the glass and drank. And? Pain. A grinding in the bones. Nausea and horror. A horror of the spirit beyond imagination. And then suddenly... It was as though I awoke from a mortal sickness into the sweet light of day. I felt younger, happier than I had ever been. The bonds of obligation had been broken. I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of sensual images rushing through my mind. A new freedom of the soul. I stretched with the sheer exhilaration of it. And I saw my hands. You have good hands. Smooth, trustworthy. Is that how you would describe these? I... In here, there was no mirror. Outside, trees hacked out of darkness against the dawn. A stranger in my own house, at last I reached my room. Looked in the mirror and saw for the first time... <laughs> Edward Hyde! He was smaller, slighter than my usual reflection. Younger, yes, but already with the imprint of degradation and decay. Horrible. No. What I felt was a leap of recognition. This, too, was me. The wild, exciting part that I'd suppressed all my life. As Hyde, I was about to explore every fantasy I'd ever had. Lust, dominance, torture. Edward Hyde was pure evil. And you embraced this? Oh, yes. Yes. But the second and critical part of my experiment had yet to be tested. Suppose I'd lost my identity forever. So, hurrying back to the laboratory, I once more prepared the drug and drank it. Once more suffered the racking pains of dissolution. And came to myself with the character and face of Henry Jekyll. Yet you did not decide to put an end to it? I can't tell you, John, how bored I was with my life. Growing older only made me more angry at the restrictions closing in on me. I would feel merrily disposed at times. My pleasures, to say the least, undignified. Now, I had only to take the drug and instantly throw off the body of the respected doctor and assume like a thick cloak that of Edward Hyde. I laughed whenever I thought about it, and I made plans. 
I rented the house in Soho, let Hyde be known to my servants, and wrote my will in his favour. Those things taken care of, I no longer existed. The pleasures which I rushed to indulge were, as I said, undignified. But soon, in the hands of Edward Hyde, they began to turn towards the monstrous. Now, things I had never even thought of. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Things I so enjoyed. I lived in wonder at my vicarious depravity. Yet whatever Edward Hyde had done, I simply had to take the antidote and he would pass away like a stain of breath upon a mirror. And then one morning... <gasps> my hand. My hand. Coarse. Coarse and knotted. Knotted. Covered in hair. Dear God. Edward Hyde. I have become Edward Hyde. I dressed and slipped out of the laboratory. Within half an hour, I was sitting down to breakfast as Dr. Jekyll again. But I knew the power of the drug was declining. I was having to take more and more of it as Hyde began to dominate me to the point of spontaneous change. I had to choose. I chose the path of righteousness. But I neither got rid of the house in Soho nor destroyed Hyde's clothes. Eventually, in a moment of weakness... I took the drug again. My devil had been caged for too long. A glorious evening. Perhaps the last that we shall see. A young man like you. I'm sure you write poetry. The beauty of God's creation. God? Save your superstition for yourself. You should be in your grave. <coughs> Left <coughs> to rot! <coughs> I broke Sir Danvers as a sick child breaks a plaything. But in the height of my delirium, a cold terror gripped me. I saw my life was at risk. Mr. Ryan, is that you? Can't you see I'm busy? Get back into your room! Break my heart, thou warbling bird. <sighs> thou minds me, oh, departed joys, departed never to return. <laughs> an end to all things. It was a bright January day. Regent's Park was full of winter chirrupings and the scents of spring. I sat on a bench in the sunshine, the animal within me licking the chops of memory. I smiled, comparing myself with other men, the robustness of my good works as against the cruelty of their indifference. And at the very moment of that arrogant thought... A panic swept over me, nausea and shuddering. It left me faint. And then as the faintness subsided, I became aware of a growing boldness, a contempt for danger. My clothes hung loosely on my body and the hand on my knee was hard-knuckled and covered with black hair. My reason wavered. 
How was I to get my drugs? I was now a murderer. If I entered the house as Hyde, my servants would call the police. And that's when I thought of Lanyon. I hurried to an hotel. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my two oldest friends, and though we may differ over scientific questions, if you fail me tonight, I am lost. This is what I need you to do. Drive straight to my house. You will find Poole waiting for you with the locksmith. The door of my laboratory is to be forced and you are to go in alone. There you will see a cabinet from which you are to remove the fourth drawer from the top. You will know if you have the right one by its contents. Some powders, a file and a notebook. Take this drawer exactly as it is back to your house in Cavendish Square. Then... At midnight, I ask you to wait alone in your consulting room. Oh. Not what I call medicine. And his notes. Single, single. Dosage. Single, single, single. Double, double, triple, triple. Total failure. Ah. Are you from Dr. Jekyll? So you're shaking. The medicine. Come, let's do this properly. Sit down and tell me what's wrong. Excuse my rudeness. Blame the urgency impressed upon me by Dr. Jekyll. The powder's over there. <laughs> Have you a measuring glass? Here. Uh. Would you like me to leave before I drink it? Think carefully. Or you can see ripped open before you. The whole new world of knowledge to blast the unbelief of Satan. You speak in riddles. So, you who have denied the possibility of transcendental medicine, behold. to my house and got into bed. So deep was my gratitude for my escape that it almost resembled the brightness of hope. I was strolling across the courtyard after breakfast, enjoying the sting of frost in the air, when once again I was seized with the spasms that had attacked me in the park. I only just had time to reach the laboratory before I was raging with the passions of Hyde. It took me a triple dose to bring me to myself. And then, six hours later, as I sat staring into the fire, the pangs returned, and I had to take yet another. From then on, it has only been through the escalation of the dose that I can remain as Dr. Jekyll. If I close my eyes for a moment in my chair, I wake up as Hyde. I'm consumed with fever. The powers of Hyde seem to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll. He scrawls blasphemies on the pages of my most treasured books and is stamped upon the portrait of my father. If it were not for his fear of the gallows, he would long ago have ruined himself in order to ruin me. But his love of life is wonderful. And knowing how he fears my power to end it all, I find it in my heart to pity him. Until now. Jekyll... For God's sake. Uh, time fails me, John. 
The store of the special salt has run low. It is only with the aid of the last of the old powders that I have been able to explain all this to you. I have made my decision. Soon both of us will die. Jekyll and Hyde. I only ask that it is before I take on that monstrous personality forever. No! Please! Father in heaven, have mercy! This is the true hour of my death. No. Henry, give me your hand. Together we will... Together. Yes. Never. And so, the life of Henry Jekyll... And Edward Hyde... ...comes to an end. In Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, dramatized by Yvonne Antrobus, Jekyll and Hyde were played by Adam Godley, Utterson by David Horovich, Mrs. Utterson by Christine Kavanagh, and Enfield by Mark Straker. Dr. Lanyon was played by Sam Dale, Poole by Joseph Klosker, Sir Danvers by Ian Masters, The Maid by Emma Noakes, and The Housekeeper by Bethan Walker. The director was Claire Grove. Haunted Hospital by Trevor Hoyle. Marlin 2. The ward you want is above us. Marlin 3, top floor. You do eyes, don't you? Does that involve operations? Of course. Cataracts mainly. Corneal grafts. Oh, oh, don't, don't, Sam, I couldn't do that. Not on eyes. Doesn't it bother you? Not much point being a staff nurse on ophthalmics if it did. You know, I never knew you wanted to be a nurse when we're all in with eye. You never said. In those days, I wanted to be a vet. If I stuck to that, I'd be making a bomb now. Is this it? The top floor? Marlon 3's through those double doors. I really wanted to come up here at night. Julia, I told you on the phone. All the wards closed down at six. Everything's locked up. And this ward's empty all the time. Except for all that stuff under dust sheets. Just used as storage these days. Oh, it's cold in here. Can you feel it or is it just me? They'll have turned the heating off. Or perhaps you've been living down south too long and turned into a Mardia. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Everything smells musty. What was it used for before? Ear, nose and throat. Hey, Julia, come look at the view from here. You can see for miles. Hey, so you can. As far as the motorway. I'm going to have a crafty smoke. Are you allowed? Being on duty. Why do you think it's crafty? <sighs> do you want one? No, thanks. You haven't said. Said what? Whether you're back up here for good or just on a visit. Must be two years at least since I last saw you. Oh. Well, truth is, Sam, I don't know myself. Things are a little bit uncertain just at the moment. Steve come up with you. That's one of the uncertainties. And the reason I came up here on my own. Just have a think. Where's he from? London. No, he's a Yorkshire lad from Hebden Bridge originally. And you know the old saying? <laughs> you can always tell a Yorkshireman, but, but you, you can't, can't tell him much. <laughs> oh, give us a puff on that, will you? <sighs> oh, yeah, thanks. Are you all right? Me? Yeah. Absolutely great. Apart from a... Tiny complication. 
What's that? I'm three months, nearly four actually. Pregnant. Oh. Should you be smoking? I haven't decided whether to have it or not yet. Are you really serious? About getting rid of it? I don't like that expression. It's a termination. Whatever you call it, it's the same thing. Well, I don't remember you being all that high principled in the bike shed with Darren Kershaw after a few snake bites. <laughs> I'm not being Julia, but you do seem flippant about it. As if all it takes to decide is a toss of a coin. Is it Steve? Of course it's Steve's. What do you think I am, the Crouch M bike? Sorry, kid, I'm a wee bit touchy. Oh, I can't get warm. It isn't all that cold, is it? Or is it me? It's this building. Drafty old barn of a place. Must be a hundred years old at least. A bit more than that. It's built in 1877. Oh yeah, Miss Brainbox. What month? It was opened officially in December. Facilities for the old and sick and destitute. Orphans, unmarried mothers and lunatic paupers. Fever ward for TB, smallpox, typhoid, imbecile ward for degenerates. You wasted, girl. You ought to be on the weakest link. Well, it's all in this book. An account of the opening of the new Durnley Workhouse, 22nd of December. Look at this. An advertisement in the Rochdale Times. The guardians of the poor are in want of a man and wife to act as porter and matron at the new union workhouse. The man will have to see that male vagrants are properly bathed, their clothes fumigated, that their food is supplied and that their task of work is performed, viz. the grinding of corn or the breaking of stones. A bathing room is provided where travellers get what is often a necessary sweetening which is not always relished by them. The wife, as matron, will have to search and examine the female vagrants and see they are properly bathed. The joint salary will be £40 per annum, with board, washing and furnished apartments. By order, J. Turner, clerk to the guardians. What's it for? An article or something? It isn't work-related. You said on the phone something about stories you'd heard. Read about. Nothing to do with staff hearing a baby crying in the middle of the night when there were no infants on the ward or anywhere near. I thought you didn't know anything about it. I asked one of the sisters who's been here nearly 20 years. She told me the story. A baby crying in the night. There's also the one about the thin, round-shouldered man in a ragged suit, down at heel type. He wanders along the main corridor at all hours with a scraggy mongrel on a bit of knotted string. The pair of them have been seen going into the sluice room. That's down there, at the end, on the right. But when staff went to look, the room was empty. They'd vanished. Did she tell you about the male nurse on night duty? He insisted on keeping the doors wide open at either end so he could see the full length of the ward. Frightened to death of being crept up on in the middle of the night. <laughs> By what, for instance? Dracula's daughter? Something lurking around. With a heartbeat. Just a heartbeat? Nothing else? He heard what sounded like a heartbeat in the radiators. A steady, regular beating in the old Victorian pipework. All right, then. What's your explanation? I don't know. I don't have one. Oh, there's a journal of the workhouse master, Josiah Ogden. And he mentions a young woman being admitted, Lizzie Pilling. She was thrown out of the family home and ended up in here. For... <gasps> Sam! Listen, what the hell's that? Oh, nothing. It's OK. We're high up next to the old clock tower. The mechanism still works, but the clock doesn't strike anymore. You're right. It is chilly up here. Let's go back down. Sam? What? I'm staying with my mum at the moment, but things could get a bit awkward. She brought me tea and toast in bed this morning and I nearly threw up all over her best duvet. She doesn't know about you being... No. Won't take her long to figure it out, though. 
but I need somewhere, just for a couple of nights. A couch would do. Sleeping bag? Sorry. All I can manage is a bed in its own room with a window and a door. <laughs> My flatmate's in Turkey till the end of next week. Sam, you are brilliant. <laughs> Journal of the Workhouse Master, Josiah Ogden. October the 9th, 1878. We have an old man, Frederick Rhodes, in the habit of going out without leave. He has got the itch and set it, set on, his it on his bedfellows. Also, also pensioner, pensioner Butterworth drunk gets drunk every, every Tuesday and abuses other folk very ill. October 24th. So, Yesterday we had a... Very unpleasant stir with old Diggle. He's been caught playing with Nellie Chadwick in a very undecent manner. He was in such a position as to leave no further doubt about his guilt. As to Chadwick, she is as stupid as a pig and as heedless as a stone. If not curbed, I dare say she will end up in Church Lane and join that despicable gang of loose, drunken women... December 3rd. Since last report, Lizzie Pilling, Alice Greenrod and Child have come in. It may perhaps be necessary to say a word with regard to Alice Greenrod. To give her character in a few words, she is a stupid, dirty, idle, saucy slut. I have taken what pains I could to improve her without success. That's all you've got. Just the one. I don't intend moving in for good. A couple of days at most. How's this? Will it do? Oh, Sam, this is lovely. Thanks. I really appreciate this. Get yourself settled in and I'll make a coffee. Or would you rather have tea? Tea? Earl Grey? I prefer bog standard. Not very crouch end. Well, you can take the girl out of the north. <laughs> What did your mum have to say? Does she mind? She's under the impression I've gone back to London. Is she any the wiser about you being... No, I hope not. And what about your blunt A-up Yorkshireman? Yeah, Steve knows. That's the reason I'm up here, to get away from him, continually piling on the pressure. Oh, it got me down. I think I get it. I don't think, to be honest, you get anything. Oh. Shut up, Sam. I'll go and brew the bog standard tea. Hello? <sighs> it's you. No, I didn't walk out, Steve. Not in the way you mean it. I don't know. A few days? No, I'm at Sam's place now. I don't know how soon. I've told you. No! No, I haven't decided. Not yet. I can't explain why it matters. Steve, it matters to me. Can you not just please understand? Oh, I don't want you to. I don't want you to come up here. We've talked at... Steve, we've talked enough. I'm going now. Bye. <laughs> How much further, Sam? Not far. Nearly there. One more floor. Oh, stop. Listen. What is it? <sighs> Told you before, Julia. It's just the mechanism in the old clock tower. Oh, yeah. I thought you said the chimes didn't work anymore. Of course they do. After midnight, everybody knows that. Here we are. Marland 3. Sam... 
I don't want to go in. What? After all the trouble I've gone to. I'm scared. The baby crying in the night. Lizzie's baby, that's what you want to hear, isn't it? I've changed my mind. I don't care. I had to steal the keys to get us in. You're going through those doors. Get in there! Oh, please, no, no. Not in my condition, it'll upset me. You're staying. Look, see who's coming. The thin man in the ragged suit with a mangy dog on a bit of string. Here he comes. Keep them away from me. Keep them away from me. I want to go, Sam, please. You're not going anywhere. Porter? Matron? What's all this commotion? What's to do? What's going on, Mr. Cragg? I don't know as yet, Mrs. Cragg. Looks like an admittance. Well, girl, who are you? Who wants to know? Show some respect. Mr. Cragg wants to know. Name? Lizzie. Lizzie Pilling. Age? Seventeen. And by the look of it, Mrs. Cragg, disgraced herself and brought shame on her family. Seven, eight months gone, I'd say. Oh, aye, we're used to her sort, aren't we, Mr. Cragg? Get dozens in here. What we call helpless women. Right, girl, let's have you. Come with us. We know how to deal with your sort. Come here, girl. Grab her, Mrs. Craig! Oh, got her, no. Mr. Craig! Oh. Oh. Get off me! Get off me! Oh, keep quiet, you little whore! Oh. You have no rights in here, oh. madam! Not after what you've oh. done! You're in here for good! No use fighting it! We've got you now! <laughs> here, you stay! Mmm. Mmm, I really enjoyed that. It's tasty. Coming from a girl who wants to use Marmite in a pudding instead of treacle, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a compliment. <laughs> I'm sorry for sounding smug yesterday. Were you? When? When I said I understood the situation between you and Steve. Obviously, I don't. Can't. Nobody can. Sam, nobody includes me. Me and Steve talked it over all through the night before I left, and I became more confused, not less. That's why what happened to Lizzie is so important to me. The awful things that she must have gone through. Lizzie? The horrible way she was treated. The abuse that she must have suffered. The young pregnant girl you told me about? What's she got to do with this? With you and Steve? Didn't I? I thought I told you. Lizzie Pilling is an ancestor of mine, a hundred years ago. My father, Ray, his mother was Sarah Pilling, and her father was a little boy born to Lizzie in the workhouse in December 1878. Right. I follow it so far, I think. The baby took his mother's maiden name. Why would he do that? She never married. Thanks. And he was brought up in an orphanage. I don't know that part of it for absolute certain because I haven't researched it all the way through. The family tree has got gaps in it. Do you know for certain that Lizzie had the child and that it was a boy? Yeah, she must have done. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, would I? You've invested a heck of a lot of time and effort in this, Julia. Not to mention a big chunk of emotional capital. It's something I had to do. I don't quite understand why, though. How is it relevant to you and Steve? It's perfectly straightforward. And I must be dumb or something. What I have to lose. What I'll have to give up. And not career, exactly, but, you know... Well, yeah, that is it. Career. I'll say it. All right for him, of course. He's got this great job in TV, well on his way up the major greasy pole. Oh, yeah, he carries on working merrily away to Steve. No problemo at all for El Stevo. I've got this ass about face. I thought it was Steve. He was the one putting pressure on you to... To have a termination? No. Steve wants the baby. It's me that's in two minds. One of them being Lizzie Pillings, apparently. Why? What's the matter? What do you mean? Do you love Steve? What? Yeah, I think I... You only think you do? No. I do. Yes. 
Then what matters, Julia, is what's happening here and now. Which is that you and Steve are having a baby together. Not any of this stuff and guff about ancestors and ghosts. I mean, come on. But Sam, I want to know why Lizzie went through with it when she'd been abandoned by everybody. What gave her the strength to make that choice? Easy, I would have thought. After all, she didn't have a career to weigh in the balance. Oh, that's me summed up then, is it? You said yourself you didn't want to be saddled with a kid. And that makes me a tart with no heart? Yeah, self-centred, selfish. Career comes before everything. You could get the keys to the ward on the top floor. But we've been up there already. Not at night. Julia, this baby crying in the night stuff, honestly, it's not healthy. Sam, are you going to help me or not? Yes, if I thought for one minute any of this made any sense or would do any good. Oh, thanks. I just hope when the day comes for you to make a choice, it's as simple and straightforward as that. I didn't have a choice. I had a miscarriage. Oh, Sam. I lost my baby 14 months ago. Oh, Sam. Oh, I never knew. I'm so sorry. Really. Really, I am. So am I. You see, Julia, I do understand about choices. To the guardians of the poor. Gentlemen, I append herewith a letter addressed to me from E. H. Carter, vagrant relieving officer, as follows. Sir, Daniel Barnes, a tramp, was admitted to the vagrant ward on Tuesday night at 9pm. He made demands to see an inmate, Lizzie Pilling, who I later discovered was big with child. I refused his request. On Wednesday morning at 6am, he was put in the tramp cell to break 800 weight of stone, which he refused. He said I could do what I liked, but he was buggered if he would break any stone. He has been sent before the medical officer for reports. Your obedient servant, Elias H. Carter. Come in. Go on, get in. Mr Pinch, sir, this is Barnes, sent by Mr Carter for reports. Stand still there, you. Right, leave him be, Porter. You can go. Pardon, sir, I'm not sure it should be... Mr um... Cragg, I said go. Very good, sir. What's that blood on your chin? That were him. Clothed me. Just cos I would Pay attention, Barnes. Mr Carter has got you down here as Tramp, age 23. You've got no permanent residence, then? I have lodgings on Arthur Street. Where's that? Spot and Bridge. I had regular work as well, till I was laid off. What has? Fran let make upper. Hmm. This is a queer do. Have you been admitted to the spike before under another name? Halifax Harry or Small Bridge Dick? No. He wouldn't let me in otherwise. I told him I'd no way to sleep for the night. So, you came in under false pretenses in order to see a young woman, Lizzie Pilling. You accepted our charity, but refused to do anything in return. Are you familiar with her circumstances? She's 17, this girl. Unwed, heavily pregnant. Are you familiar with her condition? Aye. That's why I wanted to see her. She's getting near her time and I was worried about her. Her and Bobby both. I see. The child she's carrying. Is it yours? I don't reckon that's any of our business. I won't stand for your insolence, Barnes. I can have you sent to the new Bailey on Rope Street quick as a flash. And let me correct you on one matter. It is my business. And my Christian duty mores the shameful pity of it. Oh, and Lord knows this woman you've come to see. Girl is even worse. No pride, no dignity, 
No shame, even. Hey, what do you mean by that about Lizzie? I mean she has no more sense of common decency than a dog rutting in the street. Hey, that's she not... might as well be off and join the church laying gang. That's a foul thing to say about a young lass. Lizzie's not a bit like that. You know nothing about her. Obviously, I don't know her at all. In the way you do. But somebody has to take charge of these fallen creatures and their wretched offspring. Mister, listen. Listen. All I'm asking is for five minutes with her, please. Not for me to say. That's up to the workhouse master. Porter! I've been called upon for my medical opinion, which is that you're perfectly able to perform the task of work allotted to you. I shall issue a certificate to that effect. Sir, Mr Pinch? Come find this man. <laughs> right. Let's have you, Sonny Jim. Hey, up, come on, move it! You talk about Christian duty. What about Christian charity? I'm telling you for the last time, shut your gob! I'm not that young either, but I'll do as well as her, won't I? Ooh, what a big, strong lad. <laughs> Creeping here, lovely boy, where it's nice and warm. Get, get off me, woman. Let go. Where is she? Is it? And over here. Near the window. Is it? Are you all right? <clears throat> Daniel. It, is it? Why have you come? They catch a man in here. Shh, calm yourself, Lizzie. It's bad to get worked up in your state. They put me in vagrant cell, but I broke loose. Vagrant cell? I snaffled an iron bar in, bent the lock. I had to come. I had to. But why was she in there? You're not a tramp. They told me I had to break stone, but I said I was damned if I would. Oh, but I had to see you, Lizzie. I was afeard for you and for the baby. You... You haven't done now, have you? Done what? What do you care? Why is it your business, any road? You know what you did before, is it? You were right, flaming chick, you done your pants. What you that got knocked up in pudding club? Shh, shh, shh. Don't be fretful, it's not good for you. <sighs> not any good for the mind, is what you mean. That Paula Jen didn't do me no harm at all.
it for you. You take on another man's child? I'd give the world for you, Lizzie. But you hardly know me. Just because we live on the same street. I noticed you though straight away. And the first minute I clapped eyes on you, I thought you were a peach of a girl. <laughs> when was that? The day I moved into Arthur Street, just on two years ago. You're a very decent chap, Daniel. Offering to take on me and a child. But it won't be fair when I don't feel anything. I can find work, Lizzie. I know I can. Clover and Croft Mill are after doff as I heard. Come to your trade. I can learn. I can do out I want if I send my mind to it. Can you make me love you? I can do that too. I know I can. If you'll let me. Who? Oh. Lizzie, Lizzie. Oh my God. Oh my God, what's happening? Daniel, go. Go Go on, get out, please. I'll fetch somebody. Get somebody to help you. Oh, get out quickly before they come, please. Somebody, please help me. The door, over there, is the corner. That's the matron. Would you get her for me? I can't see you. Get her yourself. Oh. 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 Please come quick. This is having a baby. She's in terrible pain. Oh. Come on, come on. Evans, a man? What are you doing in these quarters? Uh, Missy, she's, Lizzie, uh, she's in labour. You must uh, help her. Daniel, go! Please go! I'm swearing a gander at you, my lad Who's causing all this commotion? It's this man here, Mr. Crank. I don't know how he got in. He's terrorising all women. I've not touched nobody. I want you to help Lizzie. Uh, all right, Joe, Mrs. Crank. Oh, you two, uh, get a grip Daniel, on him. run! Hey, yeah. run! Fast, I've got him. He's not going nowhere. Oh, oh, it's you, is it? Oh, my word, Sonny Jim. You're for the high jump now, all right? Right, lads, march him off smart. Double quick. Get up there. All right, all right, shut it. We'll see to you. The fancy man's not much good to you now, is he, eh? <laughs> now his tuppence is spent. Neither use nor ornament. <laughs> and what's you left you with, eh? Don't you worry, girl. We'll take care of you. And your bobby and all. Don't <laughs> put pops out, we'll have it off your hands in no time. Send straight off to cottage homes over you yonder. It'll never bother you again. <laughs> and then, you know what? We'll find you a nice, comfy berth. Oh, aye. There's plenty to do here for a young, strong lass like yourself. Working in kitchen and laundry. Plenty you can do to pay us back for our kindness. Daniel. 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 Don't take the baby away. Please don't take the baby away. Don't take it. Wait, Daniel. Julia, Julia, wake up! Julia, wake up! We get down, honey. You come. What's, what's happening? What's happening? You were having a nightmare. You kept shouting a name over and over. Who's Daniel? Oh. What's the matter? Do you feel sick? My head. You've been drinking. Was this full? Julia, this bottle of vodka. Don't look at me, Sam. You sound like Steve. There's less than a third of a bottle oh, left here. What do you expect me to do, Sam? Steve's against me. You won't help me get on the ward. Lizzie's gone into labour, and I'm afraid that my mum's going to find out. Julia, stop this. Into me. Stop it. You're not dreaming now. This is real and happening now. Lizzie died a long time ago. She had a baby over a hundred years ago. Where did she find the strength from? Nobody will tell me. What happened in the workhouse all those years ago has nothing to do... Nothing, no bearing on you and your baby. It's preying on your mind, giving you these nightmares. Oh, my head. Oh, I'm sick. I'll get you some aspirin. Have you any in your bag? Where did you get these from? Julia. What? These tablets, Mifepristone. You haven't taken any, have you? Not yet. Oh, thank God for that. I was told that they could induce labour. Yes, they can. Taken with alcohol, they can also kill you. 
I might have come in here in the morning and found you dead. Is that what you want? I can't believe you'd be that stupid or that desperate. I am. Oh, Julia, I, I wish I could help you. I've told you how, if you really want to. Is that Steve? Yes, who's that? I'm Sam Parker, a friend of Julia's. December 17th. Edmund Buckley died. On a Sunday, after lying in bed all week, Buckley went to courting and stopped till after dark in a chilly, damp atmosphere. The consequence was, on Monday, he began to be very badly, and from that day till his death he never had a passage through him. His last hours were endured in agony from gut rot. After the shenanigans in the women's ward, the culprit, Barnes, was apprehended in the short hours of Tuesday morning by the strenuous efforts of the porter and two orderlies. In truth, gentlemen... I am getting fed up to the teeth with this troublemaker. He has been kept in confinement to await disciplinary proceedings. Mr Ogden, sir, I've got Barnes here. Bring him in. Remember what I said. Any more bother from you, Sonny Jim. Any disrespect to the master. And you'll get t'other eye blacked as well. Next time it'll take more than you and them two bullies. Get in! Do we need the porter to stay, Mr Pinch? No. Wait outside, Mr Cragg. Aye, sir. Right oh, sir. Think on you. And watch your tongue. You and me's not done yet, matey. <sighs> I'll be honest. I, I don't know what to do with you, Barnes. You've caused nothing but uproar and strife since the minute you were admitted. You refuse to perform a simple task of work... Even though Mr Pinch has certified you're perfectly fit and capable to do so. Fit as Barney's bull, Mr Ogden. Now, we've had enough of you before this last disgraceful episode to put the tin lid on it, forcing your way into the women's ward in the dead of night, causing hysterics and panic. No, I never. I'm only thinking of Lizzie, trying to help her. She was in dreadful pain. Lizzie Pilling. A young stray wench he impregnated Mr Ogden, who was about to give... I, I know all about that. I read... Carter's report. Now, has the woman been delivered of the child yet? She had it at seven o'clock this morning. The matron was in attendance. Was you all right? Was it a boy or a girl? What news of mother and child, Mr Pinch? I'm not certain this fellow has any right to be... Yeah, there whatever our scruples on the matter, Mr Pinch, he is, after all, the father. I'm informed the woman is comfortable and the lad has taken the teat. So, Barnes, transpires you have a baby son. Is there somebody with him? On what? You know, keeping an eye on Lizzie, like, and Babby. I find this sudden concern very touching. Rather late in the day, though. Nine months too late. You know, it makes my blood boil. These feckless, work-shy layabouts scattering the seed and breeding the brats all over the place. It's not like what you think, mister. I really love her. I do, honest. <laughs> Damn it, Barnes! If you were a halfway decent man, with an ounce of backbone, you'd have taken responsibility for your own doing and made a decent woman of this girl! Yes, very well, let that be, Mr Pinch. Why do you accuse me of shirking her? How do you know I didn't want to? Because I can see the evidence of my own eyes. I can tell your type a mile off. That may well be so, Mr Pinch, but it's none of our concern. Me, I'm more vexed with the upheaval he's caused throughout this institution. Make no harm, sir, but they ain't treated me right. They haven't been fair. No, I'm not having that. I know for a fact that Mr Pinch has gone out of his way to be reasonable with you. Even the porter, Mr Cragg, has been considerate 
and above board in every way possible. And the daft or what? And kick lumps out of me, did that swine him and them two gormless dead legs he calls orderlies, but just you wait. Oh, yes, wait till I spy your lad on the outside of these walls on his own. Am I actually hearing this? It's beyond credible belief. No, it's true, I tell you. They never missed a chance, Lottie, to count me. Barnes, quiet. Now you stand there, bold as a brass clock, issuing threats towards loyal and respected servants of the Union Workhouse. Do you not yet grasp the gravity of your situation? Are you dead in the brain or what? Why, what do you mean? I've done no wrong. All I did was to come here to see Lizzie, and I get abused and thrown in a freezing cold That's cell. it! Enough! Stop! Now, will nothing give this man a, a hip of the sense? Well, we'll see who can. You will be taken before the magistrate's barns at the earliest opportunity. Send for the porter. Porter! Now, let them teach you a lesson, one I hope you will never forget. Now, should they decide your disruptive conduct and, and threats to workhouse staff means the assizes, so be it. As for myself, I'm, 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 I'm fed up and glad to be done with you. Yes, sir, Mr. Roger. Mr. Craig, send for Constable Travis. I want this man taken straight away to the new Bailey. Ask Mr. Carter to issue a transferring order. Right, sir. Come on, let's be having you. Lay your finger on me now, what are you? Oh, I you will, will you? Yeah. You and whose regiment? Me and my own mate. It's all right, Porter, I'm with you. Grab his arm. Come on, grab it. Come on. Grab the other one. Stop. Hold him. Stop. Hold him. him. Hold him. Get in here at once. On the double. Quick. Come on. Stop. Help these men. Throw him taking him to the vagrant Stop. cell. He'll only break out again. Stop. Don't worry, I have the answer. Take him up to the padded room in the imbecile ward. Stop. He'll not get out of there in a hurry. Go in a coward. Slide the gate open! Hurry up, damn it! You two, hold him while I get the door! Oh, you swine! I want Lizzie! Right, lads, push him in! That's it! In you go, son of Jim! God. Oh, take care of Lizzie and the new baby. Make her love it and care for it and not harm it. What are you chuntering on about, you idiot? Of course you won't hurt it. She's a sweet soul. It's not in her nature. And as for you, Jacob Pinch, so-called doctor, with a heart of stone who called my sweet Lizzie evil names, I'll come back one day and haunt you and your kind. Not one of you'll rest easy in these cold stone walls. Never ever again in the dead of night time, I swear it. Because then you'll hear... You won't get into trouble, will you? Borrowing the keys to get us in. If I do, I'll know who to blame. Sam, I can't see a thing. It's pitch black. We can't turn the lights on. Wait, I've brought a torch. How's that? Stop. Wait a minute. I'm not sure this is such a great idea. Sam, we're in here now. What was I thinking of? Letting you talk me into doing this. Being a good friend. That's what. In the middle of the night. I must be out of my tiny mind. Let's go back. No, Sam. Please. You promised you'd help me. Suppose you do hear a baby crying. So what? What's it supposed to prove? It's not meant to prove anything. Even if, if nothing happens... 
I've got to do this for my own peace of mind. Hang on a minute. You're saying even if nothing happens, it's worth risking my career for? Julia, this is about your hormones. But for me, if we're caught, it's a disciplinary hearing. At best, I'll be demoted. At worst, I'll get kicked out. This has nothing to do with the baby crying, has it? It's not even about Lizzie and what she had to go through. Except she showed guts and I've been a coward. She was strong and faced up to it and I can't even make a decision. Except a selfish one. Where are you going down? No, you're not. Come on. Let's face up to it together. Do you want the torch? No. You keep it. Please. Let something happen. Shh. What is it? I don't hear anything. I think you need Steve's support. He is the father. Why don't you ring him? I came up here to get away from Steve. Don't you think if Steve was here, he'd be able to help? Maybe. I don't don't know. I can't think straight when he's around. What about your mother, then? She wouldn't tolerate it. At least talk to her, Julia. Give her the chance to respond. It wouldn't help. I know it wouldn't. Let me talk to her. She can't be that heartless, that unforgiving. It wasn't her to blame. It was my gran. Your gran? You should have seen her eyes. Wild there was. Bulging out of their sockets, like a mad woman's. It was her who dragged me down the stairs by the roots and into the street. Julia, what are you saying? What's happening to you? And then she spat in my face in front of everybody. everybody. All All the the neighbours watching. watching. Julia... Can you hear me? Julia! It's no wonder you've been thrown out, bringing disgrace on your family. I wouldn't have nothing to do with you neither if you was my daughter. If I was your daughter, I'd be glad to get thrown out. Oh, is that a fact, Lady Muck? At least no daughter of mine would become a cheap tart, letting any man at all have his way with her down the nearest ginnel. Minutes. I'm trying to sleep here. Shh. Shh. Chap. She's all right. I'm going to sleep. You'll never guess what. I found you a daddy. Even though you're not really his. He's offered to wed me. He's a good man, is Daniel. Says he'll find us somewhere to live. A little house. Just as soon as he can get down to Clover and Croft Mill and get his a job. Didn't know for sure when, though, because his landed his hell in trouble. Well, nothing to fret about. You and me can wait till he comes out. <laughs> He'll have a long wait, too, love, if he's sent to the assizes. He'll look after us, will Daniel? Then we'll be together, the three of us. A proper family. I would bank on it if I were you. <laughs> she hasn't a clue. Penny hasn't dropped. What are you blathering on about? Better face it. Your man's gone and he ain't never coming back. What do you mean? Never heard of Botany Bay. (laughs) No, it's not true. He is coming back. I wouldn't hold my breath if I was you. For pity's sake, missus, won't you shut your breath up? Aye. Put the bear under the blanket. That'll keep him quiet. Five minutes should do it. Say, you rolled over on top of it in your sleep. Sure nobody be none the wiser. You'd be shot of it then. I could never, never do anything like that. It's against the law. What if I got caught? Oh, bye. <coughs> oh, tell on you. Not us. Not a peep. Not if you paid me. Well, it would depend how much. What if they're right? And that's me damned and done for. 
on my own and Daniel never coming back. No future to look forward to now, I'm saddled with you. Squawking, puking, millstone round my neck, dragging me down. You've put a curse on me, you have. You're my cross and my burden. Who's to know if he wants to slip down under the blanket? Easily done with me dozing off. And say I, I rolled over in my weariness. And then a few minutes later I wake up and find you smothered and limp without knowing why. And you yourself won't fret. You wouldn't feel very much, little chap. Drifting away peaceful and quiet. Never knowing what's happening in the world. Then you'd be free as air. You could go back home. If they'll have me. Well, that's your own stupid fault. Shouldn't have fallen into temptation and got yourself knocked up, should you? Oh, that it would take a heart of stone. I could never lift a finger to arm you. Poor little mite. And I'd strike dead anyone who tried. Julia! Julia! Julia, can you hear me? Sam. Yeah, I can. Julia, I heard it. The baby crying. I heard it just like you said. Oh, what's wrong with you? <gasps> what's the matter? <sighs> My stomach. Oh, I'm in terrible pain. You didn't take that drug, did you? No. I threw the tablets away. I did, honestly, I did. Oh, uh, Sam, help me, please. Julia. Julia. Oh, what? What are you doing here? Well, thanks for the warm welcome. I told Sam I didn't want to see you. She's no right to tell you where I was. Hey, don't go blaming Sam. She was worried about you. I was hoping you weren't still mad at me. I'm not mad at you. I was more upset. You didn't seem to care or understand what I was going through. I did understand, Julia, and I did care. It was the other stuff. Looking into the past, your obsession with that girl. I thought it was, well... Demented? I never said that. Unhealthy, you said. Morbid. I think you threw neurotic in for good measure. I may have done. In the heat of the moment, I'm sorry. It was hurtful. I don't know if I can believe you. I wouldn't be here otherwise, would I? And I've brought something to show you. What is it? A letter. Who from? Listen. Madam, this is to inform you that your daughter has been delivered of a healthy baby son. We are advised that Lizzie was forcibly evicted from the family home on Arthur Street by her grandmother, Mrs Florence Billing. Despite this domestic upheaval, I implore you to find it in your heart to provide a welcoming abode for mother and infant. If no such provision can be made, the only alternative, I fear, is for the child to be taken into care and for your daughter to be detained permanently within the union workhouse, or, if no such place can be made available, to face destitution. Therefore, I urge you, in the true spirit of Christian compassion, to come to the aid of your daughter and newborn grandchild in their hour of need. I remain, I remain respectfully, respectfully yours, yours Josiah, Josiah Ogden, Ogden, Master Durnley Workhouse. Where did that come from? I spent all yesterday afternoon in the local history archive. I photocopied it from the workhouse records. I thought, while you were in here recovering, I'd help you complete the picture. I didn't know Ogden had written to Lizzie's mother. It's rather a touching letter, don't you think? 
Thanks for doing that, Steve. I was glad to. How are you feeling? A few days rest and I'll be fine. No complications. I know you were worried I might do something, but that's over now. It's clear in my mind. Do we both want the same thing? Yeah, we do. Come here. You were right. I did become obsessed with what Lizzie Pilling went through. So dreadful, being abandoned by her family, thrown out onto the street. She had a hell of a tougher struggle than me. What was her mother's reply to Ogden's letter? Nothing. She, she didn't even bother. Everything happened as Ogden said it would. Uh, the baby was taken into care, six weeks old. He was christened in the workhouse with the name Lizzie chose for him. Daniel. Daniel Barnes. Flannelette maker-upper of Arthur Street, Spoddenbridge. He must have really loved my great-great-grandmother to do what he did. What happened to him? Bars was sent by Rochdale magistrates to the Assizes and convicted of aggravated fray. In April 1879, he was put on a ship at Liverpool for Australia. That's the last anyone heard of him. Uh, and Lizzie? Ogden managed to find her a place in Durnley Workhouse as a laundry maid. She spent the rest of her life there and died in 1899. 38 years old. That's so sad. God, a miserable, empty existence. There's even sadder. Some women were still there as late as the 1970s, who'd had their babies taken from them as young, unmarried girls. They were in their 80s by then and had never set foot outside the hospital. No, is that true? Yes, it is true, according to the records. Oh, but that is terrible. Almost wish I hadn't told you now. Julia, please, promise me you won't start all over again, raking up the past. Let them rest in peace. You and me, we've got our own lives to lead now. All three of us. In Haunted Hospital... Julia and Lizzie were played by Joanne Knowles and Sam by Eliane Byrne. Steve and Daniel were played by Michael Begley and Ogden by David Fleishman. Pinch was played by Mark Chatterton, Mrs Cragg by Barbara Martin, Mr Cragg by James Quinn and The Irish Woman by Martine Harry Davis. Haunted Hospital was written by Trevor Hoyle and directed in Manchester by Liz Leonard. Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Browsing through a book of quotations the other day, I came across the old Scottish prayer to ward off evil spirits, you remember, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> well... Isn't it strange how the coming of night can alter the whole shape, appearance, even the atmosphere of a house or a room? Sounds are different at night, too. Anyway, reading that old incantation, I was reminded of the tragic case of Raymond Hewson. It's an odd story which I've called the waxwork, so let me tell you about it. Some years ago... I was working on a film in London. One evening after we'd finished, I decided to take advantage of a little free time before a dinner engagement and to walk back to my hotel, exploring London as I did so. I'd been walking for about an hour when I came across an inviting-looking pub in an alley just off Baker Street. I went in and ordered a glass of beer and a sandwich. No sooner had I got my drink, enjoying the early evening atmosphere of the place, then I was surprised to hear someone calling my name. Vincent! I say, Vincent! Oh, 
good Lord, Raymond Hewson. <laughs> I haven't seen you for years. Yeah, that's right. Not since, um... Oh, not, not, not since I, I did those extra bits of dialogue for that film. Yeah. Um, what was it called? Um, oh, dear. Uh, the Thing Without a Thing, or oh. some such name. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, 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 I must say, it really is the most amazing coincidence running into tonight, of all nights. I, in fact, in a, in a way, uh, you might say it's providential. Raymond was a spare, pale man with lank brown hair. And although he spoke plausibly, even forcibly, he had the defensive and somewhat furtive air of a man used to being snubbed. He looked, in fact, exactly what he was, a man gifted somewhat above the ordinary, who was a failure through his own lack of self-assertion. He made a living as a freelance writer, and like most freelance writers, he was always hard up. Indeed, when he spoke of our meeting as being providential, I half expected that he was leading up to asking for a small loan. But that night, Raymond had other things on his mind. You see, I've, I've arranged to spend tonight, all night, <laughs> in the Chamber of Horrors at the Waxworks round the corner. I'm hoping to write a piece about it and you know, get it published. Now, if I could work one or two observations from you into the story, it'd be a great selling point. Um, do you mind? Oh, no, not at all. Look, Vincent, I know you're very busy, but um, I wonder if you'd mind doing me a favour. Oh, anything, my dear chap, within reason. Well, all I want you to do is come with me to the waxworks and see me settled in. No, it won't take very long. It's only a few minutes' walk. Well, I do have a little time to spare, and I must confess that I, I find the idea rather interesting. Oh, good for you. Well, now, look here. Let me buy your drink, and then we'll go round to the waxworks. Um, now, I have an appointment with the director, Miss Frain, at half past seven, so we've just got time. You must realise, Mr. Hewson, that there's nothing new in your request. In fact, we have to refuse it to different people at least three times a week. What kind of people, I wonder, would want to spend all night alone in a waxworks? Oh, mostly foolish young men who've made bets or who are trying to prove something to themselves. Do you always refuse? We do, I'm afraid. You see, if some young idiot were to lose his senses, we should find ourselves in a most embarrassing position. Of course, in this case, your being a writer, Mr. Hewson, somewhat alters the situation. I suppose you mean that writers have no, no senses to lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But one imagines them to be responsible people. You can't know many writers, Miss Frayne. <laughs> and, of course, in your case, we have something to gain. Publicity. Publicity. Um, yes, well, uh, that brings me to another point. I think I know what's coming. Well, I have, in fact, already been in touch with our advertising manager, and he has agreed that in the event of your article being published in one of the national dailies, you will receive some payment from us. Raymond, how do you intend to treat this story? Well, to make it gruesome, of course. <laughs> um, well, gruesome, but with just a saving touch of humour. But I don't have to tell you anything about presenting horror with humour, Vincent. Well, perhaps not. I think I get the general idea. Well, Mr. Hewson, I wish you good luck with the story. But first, I must warn you that it is no small ordeal that you are about to attempt. And I confess that it's not something I should like to do. May I ask why? It's so difficult to explain. But I'll tell you what, come along now and see for yourselves. But I warn you, Mr. Hewson, that if you are at all susceptible to atmosphere, you are in for a most uncomfortable night. Oh, that's all right. Newspaper editors never stop telling me I've no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> Although Raymond appeared to take the whole affair lightly, I knew him well enough to realise that he was not looking forward to the ordeal. He was obviously down on his luck, and I rather think he saw the whole thing as a last desperate gamble. These thoughts crossed my mind as we followed Miss Frayne through half a dozen rooms where attendants were busy shrouding the kings and queens of England and those others whose fame or notoriety had rendered them eligible for this kind of immortality. I've asked the porter to make you as comfortable as possible, but don't expect too much. I've also given instructions for the figures downstairs to remain uncovered. Through here, gentlemen, please. Oh, before I forget, I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare here this afternoon. I don't know who raised the alarm, but whoever it was, it proved to be a false one. Mind your heads as we go downstairs. Miss Frayne led the way down an ill-lit stone stairway, which conveyed the sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon. 
On reaching the bottom, we passed along a small passage in which were displayed a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Spanish Inquisition and a pair of early English stocks. In turn, this corridor opened into a dimly lit room with a vaulted roof. It was by design an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, the very atmosphere of which invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxworks' figures stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Seeing them elsewhere without knowing whom they represented, one would have thought them a dull, even a shabby-looking collection, but gathered together in that sinister room. Ooh! Well, here we are, gentlemen. Recent notoriety is rubbing shoulders with all the old favourites. Perhaps you recognise one or two of them. This, of course, is the famous Dr. Crippen. Insignificant little fellow, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Over there is Wilkinson, the strangler. And there you see a tableau depicting the murder of the two little princes in the Tower of London. It's a very dark Tower of London. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that I can't give you any more light, but that's all there is. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as murky as possible. Good Lord. Who's that over there? Ah, oh, yes, I was coming to him. That's one of our star turns. A present-day murderer who has never paid the price for his crimes. The figure which Hewson had indicated was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore waxed moustaches, spectacles, and a voluminous cape. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded me of a stage caricature, something out of one of those delightful bedroom farces by Fede. I, I could not say precisely why that mild-looking face seemed so repellent, but I found myself instinctively taking a step backwards. Nasty-looking character, isn't it? <laughs> Who is it? That is Dr. Bourdet. Bourdet. I've heard that name recently, Bourdet. I can't remember in what connection. You'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. For a long time, he was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night. Oh, yes, I remember now. Wasn't it said that he killed people for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him and always with a razor? That's mm. right. After his last crime, he left behind a clue which set the police on his trail. In fact, they soon amassed enough evidence to send him to the madhouse or the guillotine, on a dozen capital charges. But I, I thought you said... That he was never caught. Oh, he was caught all right, and tried and convicted. But somehow he managed to escape and cheated the guillotine. One or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place in London quite recently. But then it's queer, isn't it, how every notorious murderer has imitators. Anyway, most of the experts believe that he is quite definitely dead. Well, I don't like him at all. <laughs> Oh, and those eyes. Whew. They seem to bite into you. Yes, don't they? This figure's a little masterpiece. It's excellent realism, really, for Bourdet practised hypnotism and was supposed to mesmerise his victims before dispatching them. Oh, I see. I, I was wondering how so small a man could have managed to overcome his victims. Well, it was mesmerism. At least there was never any sign of a struggle. D do you know, I, I thought I saw him move. Oh, come on now, Raymond. No, he moved, I tell you. Oh. <laughs> oh, You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, Mr. Houston. But remember, you won't be locked in. You can come upstairs whenever you've had enough of it. There are watchmen on the premises, so don't be surprised if you hear them moving. I've told them you're here, by the way. Raymond, you quite sure you want to go through with this? Of course. And I think it very mean of you not to have offered to stay with me. Oh, oh cool. that wouldn't be fair, Mr. Houston. You must be quite alone. Well, don't think I won't mention you in my story, Vincent. Though I may as well tell you that I shall feature heavily as the hero. <laughs> Raymond, I assure you that even if I didn't already have a dinner engagement, I should still be only too happy to let you stay here all night by yourself. This place gives me the creeps. Well, Mr. Houston, I'll wish you a very good night. And so do I, Raymond. A very good night and a successful story to celebrate tomorrow. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> uh, 
And so we left him, and after a quick, and I must confess, welcome drink in Miss Frayne's office, I went back to my hotel to get changed for dinner. It must have been at about three o'clock the next morning that I received an urgent telephone call from Miss Frayne asking me to return to the waxworks immediately. And this is how our night watchman found him. He thought he heard somebody scream and came down here to investigate and immediately rang me at my flat. And I'm afraid that when I found what had happened, I rather, well, panicked and rang you. You see, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have his home number or anything. I understand. Have you notified the police? It's usual, you know, in cases of sudden death. I did think of it, sir, but I thought it better to ring Miss Frayne first. I could see at once it was uh, too late to call a doctor. I'm afraid I didn't think too clearly. Oh, how awful. This is the sort of thing we've always tried to avoid. What will the directors say? Well, there's time enough to let them know later. Have you any idea of how it could have happened? Not at all, sir. I just heard this scream like and came running. I noticed Raymond's notebook lying on the floor by the tape recorder, which had run out. I began idly turning over the pages... And what follows is my own interpretation of what happened from the time Miss Frayne and I had left him on that fatal evening. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Oh, thanks. Yes, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> right, now let's get organized. Now, let me see. Um, notebook. Pencils. Tape recorder. It's in working order. Flask. Yes, mustn't forget that. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's cold down here. I wish I brought a blanket. Now, <clears throat> now rough notes first and then record. Yeah, I should get a nice, creepy, atmospheric piece. Might even flog it to the BBC. Right. Um, the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which were so uncannily like human beings. The air in the chamber was stagnant, as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. <clears throat> good God, what's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Startled you, did I? I'm very sorry. Uh, Miss Frayne asked me to bring down this chair for you. She thought it might be more comfortable than the one you've got, sir. Oh, God, you made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does get you like that down here, sir. <laughs> Creepy, that's what it is, sir. Creepy. Uh, now, sir, where would you like this chair? Over here by Dr. Mordet? Uh, no, no, not there. Um, no, just leave it over there in the gangway. I'll put it where I want it later. Oh, very good, sir. Uh, will this do? Yes, thank you. Well, sir, I'll wish you a good night. I'll be upstairs if you want me. Oh, and uh, by the way, sir, don't let any of them sneak up behind you, sir, and touch you with their clammy hands. <laughs> good night, sir. Stupid old fool to give me a heart attack. Now, where to put this damn chair? Um, by the little Frenchman? God, how those eyes dig into one. Now, I know, I know, I'll sit here with my back to him, then I won't have to look at his face. Why not? I'm not afraid of him. Where am I? Come on, come on, Houston. Come on, come on, come on, old son. Your nerves have started playing tricks already. He's only a waxwork. They're all only waxworks. What was that? Something moved. Now, where was I? Yes, yes, stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. Yes, that's good. Now, uh, note here. Right. After a while, it seemed as if the figures moved when not being watched. But there was not a breath of air in the chamber to stir the curtain or to rustle a 
a hanging. Drapery. There, good. Now it's fine. Now, clean it up and get this bit on tape. <coughs> The dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which... Hello, something moved again. I could swear it. It's Crippen. Every time I take my eyes off him, he moves. Damn it, they all do. Oh, God, I'd better have a drink. All saying it's not good enough. I'm going upstairs. I'm not going to spend the night with a lot of shifty bloody dummies who move when you're not looking. Ah, what's the time? Half past one. Oh, God, six more hours. I'll never do it. <clears throat> what's that? It's Crippen again. I nearly caught him that time. You better be careful, Crippen. And all the rest of you. I'll smash you all to pieces. You hear? Do you hear me? Why don't I go? Why should I sit here scribbling when I can write all this up tomorrow? Who oh, no. <coughs> What's that? Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm Raymond Hewson, freelance writer. I've been here in this chamber of horrors for, what, a few hours. My nerves are beginning to play tricks on me. And that's all they are, tricks. Oh, I'm a living, breathing man, and all around me are statues. Dummies. They can't move, and they can't whisper. Neither can they breathe. But by God, one of them is. Somebody else in this room is breathing. You, Dr. Baudet, you moved. Yes, you did. Damn it, I saw you. Good evening, monsieur. I was right, you did move. Quite right, my dear friend. And now, let me get off this ridiculous... Platform. Don't come near me! Really, Mr. Yusson, let us not be uh, melodramatic, huh? Ah! Oh, that's better. One gets so stiff standing in the same position all the time. I need hardly tell you that I never expected to have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. Oh, what the devil are you? My dear sir... I have no illusions. <laughs> I'm not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Boudet himself. But I, I don't understand. How, how, how do, do I to... come to be here? Let me explain. You see, for some time now, I've been living quietly in England. Well, late this afternoon, as I was passing this building, I saw a policeman regarding me uh, somewhat too closely. So I uh, mingled with the crowd and came in here. And when I entered this chamber, I uh, saw at once my means of escape from the so inquisitive policeman. I don't understand. Ah, you have no imagination at all, sir. It was so simple. I raised a cry of fire, stripped my effigy of the cape, hid it, and simply took its place on the platform. Et voila! But you must have been there for hours. Didn't anyone notice you? One small boy only. He screamed and said that he saw me moving. I understood that his parents threatened to give him a good hiding on his return home. I can only hope that the threat has been executed to the letter. So you really are, Dr. Bourdette. 
What a scoop. A scoop? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, we shall see. And to think I nearly packed up and went. Fancy missing this. What a story. Dr. Baudet. The French Jack the Ripper. A slight exaggeration. But, but why do it? Why commit these awful murders? Ah, you see, the world is divided into two classes. The collectors and the non-collectors. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes. I collect throats. Uh, no, no, do not attempt to move. It is useless. You cannot move unless I say so. Uh, but, but my notes, I must get all this done. And I'll, I'll never have another chance like this. <laughs> Exactement. You have given me the opportunity of gratifying my uh, somewhat unusual whim. No, no. <clears throat> You, 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 just hold on a minute. Ah, oh, but you have a skinny neck, sir. If you will overlook such a personal way. Now, now you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Baudet. If, if you think I you can... never have selected you from choice. Oh, I like thick necks. Thick, red, meaty necks. Uh, but enough talking. Enough talking? I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I haven't got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Uh, this is a little French razor. The blade you observe is very no, 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 narrow. Look, 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 look. Uh, uh, <clears throat> look. I promise not to say a word about you being here and not to use the story until. Does the razor suit you, sir? <laughs> well, we shall look, see. Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. No, sir. Your appeals are useless. You are now completely no, no, no. under my I'll, control. I'll, I'll, you I'll, I'll cannot even head. speak unless I tell you to do so. Now, you will please have the goodness to uh, raise your chin a little. Huh? Uh, uh, ah, thank you. Oh, uh, just a fraction more... Huh? Ah. <laughs> Merci, monsieur. Merci. That is... Parfait. Poor Raymond. When I had finished reading his notes, I turned my attention to the tape recorder. Of course, the batteries had run flat hours ago... But the ever-obliging Raymond had brought along his own replacements, which were lying conveniently at his feet, unused. Carefully, I rewound the tape and switched the machine over to playback. Standing there in silence, the three of us listened as the tape played, hoping perhaps to find the answer to Raymond's sudden death. When it had finished, we stood there looking at each other, puzzled, then I rewound the last few moments of the tape and played it again. And only then did I understand. Uh, now, you, you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Baudet. If you think... Enough talking, I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Look here, look, uh, <clears throat> look, I, pr I promise not to say a word about you being here and, 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 and not to use a story until... Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired by the crowds who would soon wander fearfully among them. In their midst, in the center gangway, Raymond Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his armchair. His chin was tilted up, 
as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber, and although there was not a scratch upon his throat, he was cold and dead. His previous employers had been wrong in crediting him with no imagination. If anything, he had an overabundance of that particular commodity. As I left that sinister chamber, I glanced back. Dr. Bourdet, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion, but then, after all, he was only a waxwork. One thing, however, still troubles me, that laughter on the tape. Of course, it could have been on the tape already. It has since, I confess, crossed my mind that perhaps Miss Frayne had added it, hoping for extra publicity. Perhaps I thought that was why she had not called the police at once. But these thoughts I dismissed as being both ungallant and impractical. But what else could explain it? The alternative is too awful to think of. Could it really have been the waxworks, those vacant, staring effigies laughing at the fate of Raymond Hewson? Could it? I wonder. Well, good night. Sleep well. <laughs> That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in the waxwork was Peter Barkworth with Cyril Shapps, Joan Cooper and Christopher Bidmead. The waxwork was first recounted by A.M. Burridge, dramatized by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dias. Finding the right cottage is the most important thing. Oh, yes, we were very lucky. Did someone put you on to it? No, no, came across it purely by chance. Oh, how sickening. We were out for a drive one Sunday afternoon, that's all. Parked the car, it's well over a mile from here, you know. And yep. the trees, you can't hear us. I know how far it is, my dear fellow. Your primitive trackway did wicked things to my suspension. Oh, well, we had to have that built, you see. Well, you can tell your road builder from me that it might do well for jeeps in Ghana or Mali or some such god benighted hole, but for the home <laughs> counties it leaves a lot to be desired. Anyway, it was a beautiful evening, so we decided to go for a walk. We followed a footpath across the fields, then we saw the cottage, half hidden in the trees. Mm. We'd always said that if we ever did manage to get a weekend cottage in the country, we'd make damn sure it really was in the country, not 20 yards from a main road. It's getting harder and harder. All the decent ones get snapped up in no time. Oh, it wasn't much more than a ruin, really. But we like the area. It's reasonably close to London and anyway. Rachel fell in love with this car. Rachel, it's lovely, really, it is. I do envy you. It's funny about houses, isn't it? You know, how a house sort of welcomes or repels you as, as soon as you open the door. <laughs> We've been looking for years, on and off, but Dan seems to think that beautifully decorated cottages <sighs> just sit there in idyllic surroundings waiting for him to take out his checkbook. Don't you, darling? Mm. I felt it the very first time he came inside, almost as though something was saying, you're welcome here. Yeah, we <laughs> had a hell of a job finding out who owned it. Took my solicitor the best part of six months, and then it was the land, not the building. Well, whoever owned it, farm labourers must have lived here all right back into the 18th century. Earlier than that. That's what my father said. Oh. Ten generations of men who lived on bread and cheese, and now us. He sees it as symbolic. Of what? Oh, he didn't go into details. No, they never do. Well, I suppose you got it for about <laughs> 50 pounds, did you? Oh, a bit more than that. Not uh, too much more, though. It's absolutely <laughs> typical, you know. These things never happened to me. If I'd bought it, it would have turned out to be a medieval pigsty built on a bog. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd better have a drink. Oh, I thought you were never going to ask. Did you have the kitchen built on? Hmm? It was a sort of shed thing, but we had to rebuild it almost completely, and the loo and the bathroom. Yeah, well, if you're going to live in the country, even at weekends, you must provide for the creature comforts. I can't bear those dreadful people who leave 
lead civilized lives in offices and suburbs all week and then go back to nature and live like cavemen at the weekend. <laughs> they deposit their dung in piles under your bedroom window, and when they give you a cup of tea, it's full of boiled newts. <laughs> Don't worry, we're very civilized here. I should have asked you first, Margaret, but Dan was desperate. What will you have? Yeah, what have you got? Everything. They've got everything. Campari? With soda. Please. They've even got stereo in the bedroom. And you'll have a sherry? Yes, please. A small one. <laughs> I hate to think how much it must have cost you. So do I. There was so much that had to be done, you see. There, there didn't seem much point in half measures. A mortgage to a quite lunatic extent. But it's worth it, I think. The only thing we can possibly do in the circumstances, Dan, is despise them for the shallowness of their bourgeois values. You're quite right. When you can't afford something, moral superiority is the next best thing. You're at the beginning of a very long <laughs> story there, Dan, so if I were you, I'd forget it. No, I'll <laughs> drop it, Rachel. It would depress me even more than it would Edmund, I'm sure. I've got some photos somewhere. How it was just before the builders moved in. Oh. Where are they, Rachel? Can you remember? Oh, spare us, Ed, please. I don't think we could bear it. We'll find them after dinner. I warn you, Christmas with Dan is... It's usually ghastly. You don't what? know what you've let yourselves in for. <laughs> Margaret, you're biased. He overeats like a pig at dinner, fills himself up with gallons of red wine, then <sighs> snores and groans his way through till Boxing Day. <laughs> it's a memorable experience. Red wine? That reminds me. Margaret, where's the bag? Oh, I think I put it down in the kitchen. Oh, right. What's up with Dan? He's brought a bottle of red wine. I do apologise. Oh, don't apologise. We've got a couple of bottles of Burgundy, but nothing special. <laughs> oh, with Dan, it'll be very special, I can assure you. Dan is a wine bore. Uh, bring the bag with you, darling. We've got a little present for you, if you don't mind. Ooh. <laughs> well, actually, we've got one for you, too. <laughs> Thank God for that. Now, this, my dears, is a truly magnificent bottle of Burgundy. I know nothing at all about wine, I'm afraid, Dan. Waste it on me. Well, you could take my word for it. It's fantastic. I get it from a little place I know just near Covent Garden. The chap's a friend of mine, and he usually oh, manages right, Russell darling, that'll time. do. It's a bottle of wine, that's all. We'll drink it, and it'll taste nice, and it'll probably put us to sleep. My <laughs> wife is a barbarian. Where did you put the present, darling? By the tree. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Ah, it's a grotesque business Christmas, isn't it? Oh, the way it strikes me every year. If you're going to start talking about the commercialization of spiritual values, Head, I shall laugh out loud. Oh, just the changes it's gone through. A primitive ritual, then a Christian sacrament. What is it now? The great festival of the belly, and none the worse for that. Here we are. <laughs> oh, oh, now what's all this? This <laughs> looks very exciting. Anyway, happy Christmas. I'm so glad you could come down. It was either that or enduring each other's company for 48 hours. So I mean, <laughs> Oh, a lovely print. 18th century, isn't it? Yes, an original. Yes, I can see. What's the house? Well, that's the point. It's the local hall, as it was in about 1760. It's not there at all now. Pulled down in the 20s. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. We saw it in a print shop in Charing Cross Road and <laughs> couldn't resist it. That's the life you see, all that elegance. Everybody ought to live like that. Peacocks on the terrace and all. On second thoughts, I suppose you two are having a pretty good try. Mm, we lack the peacocks. <laughs> <laughs> My husband, you see, beneath his progressive, nay, radical exterior, is the most hardened reactionary. What? His ideal lifestyle is the 18th century rentier. Not at all. <laughs> Nothing is too good for the people. That's my philosophy. Anyway, this is our little offering. Ah. Happy Christmas and <laughs> thanks for the invitation. What is it? Oh, something made of wood. Oh, a carving. Sorry if it's a bit primitive and violent. <laughs> a woman giving birth? A bit distorted. My friends who are mothers tell me it's not quite that bad. No, no, it's, it's beautiful. Or indeed ugly, but I know what you mean. It's genuine, you know, none of your Harrods rubbish. Carved by a real live African out in the bush. Where did you get it? There's a shop just behind Knightsbridge that specialises in genuine tribal stuff. <laughs> they're, they're ritual objects, really, aren't they, these things? Well, fertility, I suppose, yes. Probably for rain. But don't they make them especially for the tourists? I'm huh? sure they do, but not this one. This was carved by someone sitting in front of a hut after a day in the fields. Probably in a time of drought or something like that. It's beautiful. Thanks a lot. It's the psychology that fascinates me. You want something to happen to the weather, so you make an object which symbolises your wishes. You use your imagination to create a fact. All artists do that. When, when you imagine a thing, it becomes true. Well, not only artists, either. Well, <laughs> if you'll excuse me now, it's time I was saying to the dinner, ah. if we're ever to eat. Oh, okay. God, I'm starving. Can I give you a hand? What she really means is they'll have a good old gossip behind our backs. Oh. 
got any dirt on you, has she? Well, not as far as I know, no more than usual. Nor me, as far as I know. Is it worth it, then, Dan, all this? Of huh? course it's worth it. Financially, you can't lose. And who'd live any other way than in maximum comfort if they had the chance? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Yeah, but what I really want to know is, is what does your old dad make of it all? That's a bit of a sore point. Well, I thought it might be. That's why I asked. We had him down for a weekend row, non-stop for 48 hours. I can't help admiring your old man. I must do an article about him one of these days. You want another sherry? Oh, yeah, yes, please. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, if we could all keep our simple beliefs, regardless of the facts? Yeah. Cheers. Ah. Uh, what did he say? Ask me if I hadn't got anything better to do with my money, which is blood money anyway, <laughs> as far as he's concerned, advertising, public relations, market research, any of the selling professions, all out. Get over there with the goats. I should have been here and put the whole lot on tape. The working class and its wealthy sons were the page or two in the Statesman any day of the week. He fixed me with his branch meeting look and said, Eddie, my son, it's no way for a socialist to live. Did he indeed? So I told him, in that case, I'm not a socialist. What did he say to that? Nothing much. I think he was shattered. So was I. Oh, the blackmail that goes on between parents and children. And the other way round. After all, if one is forced to live in a bourgeois society against one's will, as it were, I don't see why one shouldn't enjoy its legitimate rewards. I think we should be concentrating on how to be socialists and rich. No, Dan. You can't escape the old man's logic. You can't think one way and live another. I've chosen to live like this, so I suppose the rest follows. Bad news for the Labour Party millionaires. They live with <clears> their <throat> consciences. I live with mine. Politics are forbidden at Christmas. Yep. Don't let him tempt you, Edmund. He's only collecting material for an article. I've already told him that. Just time to finish the drinks. <laughs> well, we're both green with envy. No, 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 what is it? Uh, another affluent indulgence? Oh, that's my Christmas present from Edmund. Except that it arrived a bit too early. Uh, not new today, then. No, I've already been playing it for hours and hours. What, what is it, exactly? Really? <laughs> is there no end to my husband's ignorance? It's a harpsichord, oh. darling. An early 18th century piano. Oh, yes, I know. Sounds like a drawer full of old spoons. That's the way some people play it, it does, yes. <laughs> It's an indulgence, really, but I love the sound. A piano seems out of place here. It is a beautiful instrument. Play us something. But now? In the middle of getting the dinner? Why not? Something gentle and civilised to usher in the feast. You are pompous. How do I enjoy it? Play, madam, play. Ignore the interruption. <laughs> well, let me see. Beautiful sound. Mm. Just right for the cottage. Small scale, intense. Lovely. No. Neither have I. Sorry. I, I don't know where that came from at all. I can't think what it is or why I played it. Funny. Something lodged in your memory from years ago. I suppose so. Oh, sorry to make such a fuss. <laughs> For a moment, I was quite frightened. Don't know why. Frightened? Deja vu. What? Deja vu. That strange feeling of having said or done something before, or when you recognise a place you're quite sure you've never been to. Happens to everyone. You can't. 
can't beat him, can you? Always on hand with a superficial explanation. No, it's true. The wires get crossed in the mental computer and it comes up with the wrong answer. You shut up, dear man, or I shall begin to feel embarrassed. Well, I'd better go and get the dinner out. If you'll excuse me. Pour, pour some drinks, darling, and mm. put the lights on. It, it's almost dark. Mm, mm, mm. Wasn't that interesting? I don't know, was it? Oh, yes. The slightest nudge of the irrational, elbowing its way into our ordered lives. Oh, you are a journalist, you know. You're a journalist from your bootlaces to the centre of your tawdry little soul. Why the hell I should go to bed with you, I can't imagine. Now, what have I done to provoke such a brutal outburst? The irrational, indeed. But what else do you call it? It was something that happened to Rachel that she didn't understand. She's not really like that at all, usually. I mean, she doesn't go in form. Well, you know. Otherness. Not the world we live in, the world that lives in us. Oh, that's all rubbish, Dan. Just an easy way out for people like you who can't be bothered to think things through. All right, then what really happened to Rachel at the harpsichord? Well, she forgot the title of a piece of music. But why did it frighten her? That's right. We haven't a clue what went on in Rachel's mind there, except that something did and it caused fear. You won't find anyone who can give you a convincing explanation of it. But that doesn't mean it can't be explained, does it? Don't deprive him of his thrilling little mystery, Ed, or he'll have to fall back on his own intellect. No, I I'm sorry, my dears. There's masses and masses of evidence that the mind possesses other powers beyond the rational ones. What powers do you mean? Oh, transfer and survival, all kinds of things. Showbiz, darling, pure showbiz. Not at all. There are countless authenticated stories. For instance, of people being separated by thousands of miles, being aware of the death of someone close to them. If mind can be projected through space like that, why not through time? If... Haven't you ever stood on a battlefield and felt the presence of the dead? It's just imagination. You see a bleak field and because you happen to know a lot of men died there, you people it with ghosts. There's more to it than that, Margaret, isn't there? It's amply proved, for instance, that the mind can have a positive physical effect. I mean, hysterical... Paralysis, things like that. But you're proving my point, not his. The whole point about hysterical reactions is that they do have rational explanations. The point is, my sweetheart, that reason alone can't be trusted. It can look at the facts, and because of its own preconceptions, it can come up with the wrong answers. That may be true, but it in doesn't fact, mean... it's oh. particularly noticeable in your case, in spite of all this pretense of rationality. I've never known anyone colour facts to suit preconceptions quite so shamelessly as you do. Why is it that with you, Dan, sensible discussion always ends up with frivolous personal abuse? I lack intellectual fibre, that's all. Thank <laughs> God for it, too, or life would be unlivable. Oh, it's like being married to Coco the Clown. Ask what? him a sensible question, he pours whitewash down your trousers. Listen, do you remember that dreadful party game, Nelson's Eye? It always frightened me to death. No, I couldn't bear little girls' parties. I wouldn't have thought that was your scene at all. Very middle class. Oh, well, we rough children were occasionally pulled in to make up the numbers, you What's know. What's it all about? You're blindfolded, and then you have to touch certain objects and guess what they are. At the end, they plunge your finger into a raw egg and tell you you're poking it into Nelson's blind eye. Ugh. Still makes me shiver when I think of it. It's a perfect example of what I was saying. And while we're on the subject, I've just thought of an even better one. Sit still, darling, and close your eyes. What? What? Oh, what are you up to now? Are they closed? Yes. No, I don't think I trust you. A blindfold will be better. <gasps> Oh, what? Oh, Dan, what's going on? One of the uses of a neck scarf. Now, stay there for a moment. Oh. What's he doing? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, the trouble with Dan is he got to the age of 30 and then started going backwards. God help me when he's 15. <laughs> Eyes still closed? Yes. Right, keep them closed. And Edmund, you mm -hmm. say nothing, just watch. Dan, what are you doing? I have in my hand an open razor. What? An old-fashioned cutthroat razor. It's very, very sharp. <laughs> You'd never believe what some married people get up to. Quiet, concentrate. I'm coming very close to you. And with this open razor, I'm going to cut open your cheek. Oh, are you charming? I'm getting closer. The razor's wide open. It's so sharp, I daren't even feel the edge. It would lay open my finger at the slightest touch. <laughs> my husband's quite mad. Still, concentrate. Make the most of the last few seconds before the pain. I'm very close now. The blade is about two inches from your cheek. Can you feel how near it is? Dan, what is this? I told you, with this razor, I'm going to cut your cheek open. There! <laughs> oh. An ice cube melting, no damage done. <laughs> My God, that did frighten me. Point proved, I think. It was the coldness and then the, and then the wetness on my cheek. You can kill a man by the drop of water on the back of his neck if you tell him it's a guillotine. Oh, it's all that 
Morris. Oh, don't worry, darling. A little practical psychology from Dan. My husband frightening the life out of me. Quite normal. Party games, darling. No need to get alarmed. Well, dinner's ready now, so if you'd like to carry the turkey mm. through, Ed, ah. Margaret will help me with the vegetables and things. Oh, Dan, light the candles for me, would you? Oh, yes, I'm all for that kind of thing, Rachel. There's a certain ritual about eating I should be very loath to lose. I admit it's difficult to feel very close to the great spirit, opening cans of luncheon meat and fruit salad in a kitchen full of washing up. But when it's turkey with all the trimmings, the candles are absolutely essential. Here we are, then. Oh, good God. That's not a turkey. It's an ostrich. Isn't it? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, darling. Mm. Uh, would you like to sit here, Margaret? Dan, you here. Uh, You've gone much too far, Rachel. Really, you have. I warn you, I'm a terrible pig. I shan't leave any of this. <laughs> I've already made your excuses. My dear, have you noticed the carving light mm. neatly on the dish? A little idea of the architect. You can't be a socialist with a spotlight over your carving dish head. What's he doing for Christmas, the old man? Mark Laura's. We did ask him here, but... Yeah. Well, the fact is, he'll be much better off there. He'll enjoy himself much more. <laughs> Good God, I've forgotten the wine. Oh, you talk too much, that's why. They won't have had time to breathe. We're going to drink it, darling. Darling, not strangle it. <laughs> really, Dan, I have a palate like sandpaper. It won't make any difference to me. Uh, does everyone eat everything? Oh, you can work on that principle, I think. <laughs> Cooks <Corkscrew. laughs> on the table somewhere. Well, oh. here we are then. Sprouts, potatoes, bread sauce, cranberry jelly. Oh, suddenly I'm very hungry. How are you doing, darling? Well, not too badly. Oh! oh. oh. Lights out. Oh, no. The bulb must have gone. No, it not it's all of them. The kitchen as oh, well. Hell. How about that for timing? <laughs> oh, must be a few. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't fret, dear man. No <laughs> harm done. It's rather nice by candlelight. Well, dear, <laughs> my dear fellow, we'll all wait for you, and I shall save you the first glass of wine. Oh, I'm sorry about this. Well, don't apologise, Rachel. Please. Just as we were about to eat. The whole thing is so beautifully prepared. A few seconds delay is only going to put a finer edge on our appetite. Would you mind carving, Dan? Oh, well, if Ed wouldn't mind her spotlights and that. Then we can begin as soon as he's changed the fuse. Well, you're not going to inflict the Master Carver Act on us, are you? No, no, I don't have any fetishes of that kind. I don't care if they tear it off in lumps. <laughs> so I see. Actually, the cottage looks rather nice, candlelit. Just the fire. It looks nice any old how, Rachel, when you live in the dump we live in. <laughs> oh, Christ. Wait a minute. We could never do it, you know, Margaret. Not even if we had the money. Stereo. We have a talent for creating shambles and discomfort wherever we go. Every house we live in ends up looking like a bourgeois refugee camp. <laughs> all dead. Magazines, dirty underclothes and half-full cups of last week's coffee. It's all horribly true. <gasps> Try the phone. We had a candlelit evening here a week ago. I played to Ed for an hour, and then we read and sat talking. It was lovely. I bet. Oh, no, this is too much. Is everything all right? No, it isn't. What's wrong? Looks like we've got a disaster on our hands. Disaster? A bloody electrician. What is it, darling? What's wrong? Just about bloody everything. It's not the fuses. They're all okay. As far as I can see, we've lost all electric power throughout the house. There's no light, no heat, no cookers, central heating television a whole lot kaput oh god no need to panic you've all forgotten the obvious solution and what's that this is england remember <laughs> what happens every year as soon as it snows or one or two people put their cookers and heaters on at once a power cut correct a power cut either that or the government has decided to teach the unions a lesson I mean, what better time to do it than at christmas oh i do hope you're right oh of course i'm right there'll be a big inquest in the papers and they'll go on about how our democracy is at stake and then forget about it three weeks later <laughs> no it can't be a power cut why not the phone's gone, too. That's nothing to do with the power. Oh, well, don't worry, darling. It doesn't matter. I haven't uh, finished the pudding or the coffee. We've got enough food here to last a month. You wait till I see that bloody electrician. Six months it's been done, that's all, and you can imagine how much it costs. Darling, if the heating's gone as well... The fire will keep us warm, Rachel. Don't panic. I'm very sorry. I'm afraid this has spoiled everything. But not at all. The dinner's cooked to perfection. Well, there's gallons of wine and brandy and stuff, so we won't miss the coffee. Well, it's very kind of you to say so, but... Let's forget about all minor inconveniences and eat this fabulous meal. I think I'll get some candles out. Don't let the dinner spoil. Get up. Take a minute. I'd rather get it done now before we all start falling over each other. I'll help you. Ladies, finish the serving. <laughs> Any minute now, I shall begin to get the giggles. The sight of Dan trying to be helpful is almost more than I can bear. I suppose we could make coffee and a saucepan on the fire. Oh, I wouldn't trust him with a candle. He'll burn the house down. 
Society determines consciousness, then. That's what the Marxists say, but they've got it all wrong. Technology determines consciousness these days. Same thing. Put your two over there. During the last batch of power cuts, we spent whole evenings reading novels aloud to each other by oil lamp. Do you know anyone who wants a beautiful modern cottage, all mod cons, except that none of it works? Oh, this is becoming a very <laughs> moral tale. See how our civilization hangs by a thread. Oh. Throw a few switches and we're back in the dark ages. Voila! Genuine candlelight. Yeah, I don't understand it. What's that? If it were a power cut, the phone should be working. Uh, it's not conceivable that the phone and the electricity should have broken down simultaneously, surely. Of course it is. A large pylon could have fallen on a telegraph pole. You lack imagination, Edmund. That's your trouble. Now, come on, let's eat. Is there any already? <laughs> well, you can see enough not to fall over the furniture now, at least. It's very good for us anyway, all this. Gets us into practice. What for? The great breakdown when it comes. This is the latest hobby horse. <laughs> what ah. great breakdown? When all the machinery finally grinds to a halt and we all go back to the land like our forefathers and plough and dig and re-establish our spiritual kinship with the earth. Sounds ghastly. Oh, no, no, it'll be jolly good. The non-technological society. They'll still have journalists, of course. Oh, no, no. don't be taken in, Ed. He heard a ten-minute radio programme on Ivan Ilyich, and now there's no stopping him. Well, it hasn't happened yet. I hope not. So, let's eat now, shall we? We'll start the ball rolling with this bottle of wine. Ah. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice. You try that for size, Edmund. Well, well cheers, everybody. <laughs> Mm. 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 Oh, gosh. Oh, whatever. What? Mm. Darling. Oh. Look what you've done to the table. You must have gone down the wrong hole. Mm. No. What's the matter? It's not wine. What do you mean it's not wine? Of course it is. It's blood. What? It's blood. It is. It's blood. Don't be silly. It is. It's blood. Taste it. I'll get a cloth. Well, we'll see. It's burgundy. Very good burgundy. I'll let you taste it. Mmm, mm, burgundy. Beautiful. Let me wipe you. And the cloth. I don't understand. Really, taste mine, really. I'm not joking here. <laughs> it must be going mad. It smells just the same. Look! Now, that's not blood, is it? Oh, it is. To me, it is salty. It's sticky. I mean it. Stop it, Ed. Stop it. What do you mean? Whatever sort of game you're playing, stop it. Rachel, it isn't a game. To me, it it's tastes... wine! Obviously, it's wine! Give it to me! It's wine. Oh, never mind, my dear fellow. I won't insult you by bringing my own wine the next time. Dan, I believe you when you say it's wine. But to me... Oh, no, no. It's impossible, is it? Let's eat our dinner, shall we, before it finally gets cold. Yes, 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 that's a, that's a good idea. Sorry, darling, this is a very hot turkey. Mm. It's the meat. It's the meat, too. Mm. Madras style, and then some. Oh, <coughs> oh God. <coughs> Have you stuffed it with chillies and pepper seeds? <coughs> Don't worry, Margaret. I, I recognise a practical joke when I see one. Oh. Vintage blood and a bird that tastes like acid. <coughs> oh. Just oh. an ordinary turkey. Oh. I cooked it just as usual. Oh, oh my God. I think you poisoned. What's happening, Rachel? Damn! Oh, oh it's burning me. Water. Drink, drink lots of water. Oh, God, this is happening. I think we're all going to die. I can't bear it. I must get out of here. Oh. 
It's going off. No, oh, that's better. Oh, yes. Me too. Oh. No. Oh, thank God for that. Take deep breaths. That helps. <sighs> Listen. Can you hear music? I can hear it. Yes, I can hear it too. It can't be. Where's it coming from? Rachel, upstairs, she's turned the radio on. She can't. It's a mains radio, not a battery. Listen to it. What? Don't you recognise it? No. Wait. Wait a minute. It's the music Rachel plays. That's right. Where's it coming from? The air? Where do the pains come from? With me, it's almost completely gone. So suddenly. Yes. With me, too. It's very strong. How I imagine taking poison. Was, was it like that with you? Burning as I swallowed the meat. Mm. No, it's gone. So is the music. Listen. Nothing at all. Silence. Rachel's coming back downstairs. Darling? Did you hear it? Or am I going mad? We heard music. Rachel, are you all right? Upstairs, on our bed, there is the skeleton of a child. I presume it's a child. It's only about three feet long, and the head bones are rather fragile. What? That's why I asked if you heard the music. Of course, you don't believe me. But it wasn't just my eyes. I touched it, too. Come with me, Dan, will you? For confirmation or support? Both. You heard the music, then? Yes. I hoped it was in my head. Did you recognise it? Yes. Did it come from the instrument? No, it didn't seem to come from anywhere. From the walls, almost. That means it's something to do with me. Why do you say that? The music came to me first. I played it before I knew it. I'm the one. I don't see why. We all heard it. I'm very frightened, Margaret. Are you? I was frightened by the pain, but I'm not frightened now. Interested, really. Mystified. I can feel something... I can't describe what it is, but it's something dreadful. Well, I've always been a sceptic. I don't see any good reason to change yet. You will. See, when you think about it, it's a bit like a sideshow at a fair. All those cheap tricks and stunts catch your imagination easily enough, but if you go round the back no, and see the wires and pulleys that make them work... this isn't like that, believe me. It's a black hole beginning to open inside me. I can't control it. Well, I don't feel at all like that, and it's no use pretending that I do. Whatever it is, I'll be convinced when I understand it, not before. Rachel? Yes? Rachel, there's nothing in the bedroom. Nothing? Nothing at all. Everything's just as usual. There's been nothing on the bedspread. It's quite smooth. We would even put our hands on it, to be sure. My eyes saw it, and my hands touched it. It still had some milk teeth, with the new ones growing underneath. What's going on, Dad? Margaret? Something very strange. I feel quite all right now, though. Yes, so do I. Not hungry anymore. No. No trace of the pain? No, none. It went. So suddenly. Yes, that happened to all of us. But none of us tasted blood except Edmund. No. And now this upstairs. I didn't imagine it. I looked for quite a long time, and then I touched it to make sure. It was a child's skeleton, about three feet long, with bits of clothing lying on the bedspread. I really did see no it. No one has suggested you didn't. Equally, though, we didn't see it. But we've all felt or seen something, haven't we? Edmund, the blood, the rest of us, the food, the pain that just disappeared, and the music. And now, Rachel, this. And all of us, the house. What do you mean? We've all experienced the failure of all the machinery in the yeah, But that's perfectly straightforward, simple mechanics. Is it? What are you implying? That the whole thing, the power failure included, is some kind of mass hallucination? Can you suggest anything better? The clocks are still dead and so are the lights. If it's mass hysteria, something our four minds are creating between us, we're still under its spell. Nothing's been right since the lights went out. Before that, the music.
be some kind of rational explanation. I don't need any explanation. I just want it to stop. If it's a form of mass hysteria... How can what? it be? Look, we're four sane and mature people. We know what we're saying and doing. Do we, though? We think all the lights have failed, but maybe they're on all the time. Maybe they're blazing across the fields for miles. If you tasted blood and Rachel saw a dead child on the bed, that's just as possible. So that we've lost all distinction between what's really happening... And what's imagination? Well, how else can you explain what's happened in the last 15 minutes? And these delusions have come from somewhere. And if, if not from our own minds, then where? Listen, if what you say is true, then what we need to do to reassert reality is to get out of here. And if necessary, separate. Break whatever mental chain is binding the four of us together. So I suggest we get into our cars and drive away to some nice crowded hotel where there's dancing and an MC and they're all playing silly and innocent Christmas games so that we dissipate whatever it is that's been deranging our perceptions here. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. What? The car was opposite this window, wasn't it? Quite close. Yes, why? I can't see it. I can't see any dark shapes where the hedges and trees are either. Or even the grass under the window, but I can't see anything at all. Let me see. It's never absolutely dark, is it? There's no such thing as absolute darkness. There's light coming from this room, from the candles. It ought to reflect on the bonnet and the headlights. There's nothing. It's like a black curtain. Dan, give me a hammer the front door. Right. Shoulder it with me. It's not going to open, is it? No, it's not. This window's the same as the bottom of the sea. We're caught in here. I know it. Something has got us trapped. Jan, look at the upstairs window. I'll try the back door. Okay. Don't worry. And there must be some rational explanation. No, there isn't. We're caught. Black as pitch, nothing at all. And the back door's the same as the front. So that's that. We stay and sit it out, whatever it is. Well, if it's some kind of mental force that's holding us here, let's see if it'll stand up to a hammer. I shall have a brandy. I hope. These windows are made of perfectly ordinary glass, nothing special, bulletproof or reinforced. Mm. The brandy's okay. So a hammer should do the trick. I can say is that we must be a very strong-minded lot. Anyone else want a drink? We can't get out. Trying to see if it's possible to knock a house down from the inside and failing. Of course he's failing. Your logic should have told him that without all that noise. It is a little bit low on logic at the moment. Panic might be a better word. Well, there's no need for you to be so superior. You're as scared as he is. Oh, I'm sure we're all terrified. We, we do take it rather differently, don't we? You stand there mouthing nonsense about logic, whereas I, being a fatalist, withdraw into a stoical calm. Edmund tries to smash his way out with a cold chisel and a hammer, and Rachel walks up and down. No, you talk superficially and incessantly and guzzle other people's brandy. It's a bit like the Titanic, isn't it? Ed runs screaming to the captain and pleads for a lifeboat, while I lean on the rail like Noel Coward, dropping witticisms into the rising waves. Is that what you call them? <laughs> I wish he'd stop banging. It won't make any difference. Well, he's had a go at smashing out all the window frames, violently assaulted the chimney breast, tried to take all the drawers off their hinges and hammered himself silly at the ceiling in a vain attempt to get out onto the roof. Any minute now, exhaustion should set in. And what will it take to shut you up? Oh, don't get scratchy, darling. Keep Spare your cool. Spare us, then, for five minutes, please. You, you don't mind me chattering on, do you, Rachel? Yes. There is something... Now the banging's stopped. What? Something. A noise. I can't quite hear it yet. C can you hear a noise? No. What sort of noise? I can hear Edmund coming downstairs. No, something else. Not that. It's no good. Nothing will budge. 
But you can't break a window with a hammer, Ed. You certainly won't knock your way through a brick wall. How do you know? How do you know what I can do till I try it? <laughs> it's a reasonable inference. <laughs> to hell with reasonable inferences. If there's a way out of here, I'll find it. There isn't. There's just one other possibility. What's that? The fireplace. The old chimney's blocked, at least the full width of it is. But if I take the hood off, there's still probably enough room to get up the flue and out onto the roof. I'll have to put the fire out. Oh, now, wait a minute. Look. What? It's the middle of the winter. It was bloody cold driving down here. Well, I can't take the hood off with the fire still alight. Ted, there's no electricity. The central heating's dead. If you put the fire out, we'll all freeze to death. It's the only way I haven't tried. Ted, it's pointless. If you can't hammer your way through glass or open unlocked doors, then whatever it is that's keeping us here will stop you getting up the chimney. Too. I'll believe that when I see it. I'll get a bucket of water. Oh, my God. This is ridiculous. It's your logic that's at fault, Margaret, not mine. When I get that hood off, it's clear to open sky. No glass, no woodwork, no locks. Straight out onto the roof. When you get the hood off. That's just a couple of screws. So were the hinges. You're wasting your time. I'm going to try it. It's the Empire Building Spirit, darling. We can't win. Be quiet! Everybody be quiet! What? The noise. I can just hear it. What noise? Can you hear a noise? No. Listen. It's very faint. Long way off. Yes. Thunder? No. Voices. Getting closer. Is it here or outside? Or in our heads. In all four heads at once. Why not? No, it's in here. Loud. Oh, loud. Is it a hurricane? Earthquake. Brickwork. What? Collapsing. Oh, it's bursting my head. the window. What? It's broken. Didn't you hear? It is. It's broken. But the glass is on the floor, so it must have been broken from the outside. A stone? Or a bullet. Oh, good God, that's all we need. Somebody taking pot shots at us. It can't be a bullet or a stone. It's not starred at all. Its hammer must have cracked it. Yes, and the noise shook it out. That's right. So we can get out, can't we? Look, there's no glass there now. It's still pitch black. I can't feel any cold air, can you? No. But you can see it, can't you? It's broken. The glass is there, on the floor. So the blackness, that must be the night Come air. Come on, then, Ed. The honour is yours. There's just room to get your hand through. Uh, I, I can't. What? There's something in the way. What? I don't know. Can you feel it? No, I can't feel anything, but I can't get my hand through, not an inch. Q-E-D. It isn't the night air. What? There's no moon. No? Nor any stars. No, it's still pitch black. Where are we then when there's no moon and the stars have gone out? We're here, in our cottage, where we've always been. Yes, we're in the cottage, but that isn't the night air. Well then, what now, Ed? You're the commander of this little expedition. I don't know. How about putting the fire out and climbing up the chimney? Oh, for God's sake, what's the point of sneering? Do you want to stay in here? Not in the least, but I know when I'm beaten. Well, I'm not. Not by a long way. I admit I do have a rather low surrender threshold and am prone to total collapse the moment the pressure is on, but as a tactic, I can recommend it. It does have the virtue of leaving your opponent completely bemused by the ease of his victory. What opponent? Listen, supposing we try to work out what's likely to happen next, there may be some kind of... Supposing pattern. nothing does. What? Supposing nothing happens. Supposing that dreadful noise was the last of it and now we just sit here. After all, we've just had a very effective demonstration that we're not going to get out of here by any natural method. Something's bound to happen sooner or later. Why? Well, because... A totally unjustified assumption. Perhaps this is the end now. Just the four of us and time and silence. And the house. All right. Calm and rationally, let's work it all out. It's a waste of time. Why not just sit back and enjoy it? After all, in a sense, we're privileged. We're experiencing something that's probably unique. Inside the house, several extraordinary things have happened that we can't explain except by suggesting that we're all sharing the same hysterical delusion. I'm glad I married a rationalist. I always knew it would come in useful. But now, the house itself has become part of the delusion. We look through the windows and see nothing, and some inexplicable force keeps the doors closed. The same force keeps us inside, even when a window is broken. The house itself. What do you think is beyond those walls, Dan? 
Do you think it's the two cars and a patch of grass with a track leading to the main road, or, or, or is it something else, just space, perhaps? If it's just space, your rationality is wearing a bit thin. What time does your watch say? 5.30, it stopped. Edmund? 5.30. Rachel? 5.30. So does mine. So does the electric clock, and I bet you every other clock in the house says 5.32. That must have been the time when the lights went out. So, everything stopped at 5.30. Or started. Everything? And I wonder what time it is now. For a rationalist, you're getting pretty fanciful. I'd prefer to wait and see before venturing into the realms of science fiction. It's the house, I'm sure. It all began when the house ceased functioning. The machinery, not the house. It may be that the house is functioning perfectly well. I think we've been selected. What do you mean? Chosen in some way, the four of us. What for? Something nice, I hope. No, I don't think so. Oh, well, we don't achieve anything by getting all intense and visionary about it, do we? I mean, what we need to do is to keep our eyes open and our minds at full stretch. Our antennae, you mean? You look at Rachel sitting there. She's got all her receivers working at full power. It's nothing to do with intellect, what's registering on her. You want to believe it, don't you? That's what it is. But I don't. I want to know. If it is something to do with the house, it can't be the house on its own, can it? And what's that supposed to mean? Personally, I've always thought that houses were places you lived in, not malevolent spirits. It must be us as well. Us and the house together. I certainly wouldn't enter into a conspiracy with one to lock myself inside it. Don't you see what I mean? The house is crucial. It must be. It's some coordination or coincidence between the four of us and this place. Oh, really, Ed? It's getting ridiculous, isn't it? I don't see why. If we don't stick to what has actually happened and what we know, if we start indulging personal fantasy... It isn't fantasy. Then we'll very soon lose whatever sense of reality we might have left. You yourself said it. The house itself has become part of our hysterical delusion. Yes, I know, Ed, I said that, but it was just a wild hypothesis, that's all. Does anybody take it at all seriously? All right, then, hard facts. Did you have pains in your belly or not? Yes, I had pains in my belly. Did you hear the music? Yes, I heard music. And can you get out of here now? No, I can't get out. So what are you going to do about it? I'm going to sit down here and drink brandy and wait till the morning. Morning? What makes you think it's going to get light out there? That isn't night outside the window. All the clocks have stopped, all the watches too. So what time is it, Dan? Can you tell me the time? No, I can't tell you the time. How long will it be till morning then? And how long has it been since all these things happened? Two hours or twenty minutes? Calm down, Ed. There's no need to get worked up. Oh, yes, there is. I'm going to get out of here some way or another. I'm not going to sit on my bum with a brandy in my hand and wait and see what happens. There's some loophole in the argument, something that will make it all clear. If you've got any better ideas, I'd like to hear them. No, Ed, we haven't got any better ideas. And I'll tell you another hard fact, too. What's that? If it is some combination of the house and ourselves... Well, I've been here with Rachel dozens of times. We've had friends here for the weekend. But you, Dan and Margaret, you've not been here before. Well, that's charming of you, Ed. Are you trying to say that all this is our fault? Not your fault alone, no. Well, no, that's jolly decent of you. But you two are the new element in the situation. So it could be something about you and us together. And if we <laughs> want to get out of here, I think we'd better sit down and examine ourselves and the situation between us rather honestly. Well, I was briefly a member of the Communist Party, Ed, when I was at college. It's probably that. Take it seriously, I, Dan, I please. I begin to take it seriously when you insist in turning the whole thing into a ridiculous joke. What do you want us to do? Sit down and drag out all our little peccadillos and misdemeanors till a sepulchral voice booms out, He's the one! And drags one of us down to hell like Don Giovanni? No, of course I don't mean that. Retribution went out a long time ago. If there's one thing we've learned this century, it's that the biggest crooks usually get away with. I didn't say that. You know I didn't. Why must you turn everything into a joke? It's a hopeless task, Ed. Even if it were feasible, the number of possibilities is enormous. No, no. It's a simple answer, I'm sure. Something logical we haven't spotted. Why be so arrogant as to assume an answer? It might be one of those stimulating mysteries like the Marie Celeste where no one will ever know. Dan, why must you be so infuriatingly flippant? 
After all, you were the one talking about all this earlier tonight. Was I? The submerged energy of the mind and powers beyond the rational. Games with ice cubes, darling. Oh, yes, all that. The world that lives in us in spite of us. That'll teach me to keep some control over my party conversation, won't it? That's what happened, you see. You've hit it, Dan. Have I? The world that lives in us. How would it be if that world in some way took over? If the inner world and the outer world changed places? Complete disaster. My day-to-day -day life is shambles enough. My inner life is total chaos. Mine's rather vicious. All the old scores I could pay off as part of the natural order of things. So that the ordinary external world becomes subservient to the world of dreams and desires. That's it, you see. It's us. We've done it. We've projected something in ourselves out of ourselves till it's become fact. You, you said exactly that, Margaret, about the African carving. In the imagination, desires become facts. What you want becomes real. In that case, what nasty imaginations we do have. Drinking blood and dead children, a very greasy and turbulent pool inside one of us. But which one? But you're not serious, are you? Of course I'm serious. Oh, forget it, Ed. It's nonsense. One of the biggest clichés of science fiction. No, I mean it. Look, Ed, I suggest you sit down quietly somewhere and let your imagination cool down a no, bit. No, 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 no. I can see it now. I can see through all this pretense. What pretense, Ed? You and Margaret, the game you're playing. What game? Are you playing a game, darling? I'm not, as far as I know. Why are you both so resolutely determined not to be serious? Every time I get near to what's happening, you two try to head me off from the truth. But this is ridiculous. What truth? That it's you, of course. One of you two. Or perhaps both of you. None of this has ever happened before. Neither of you has been here before. And all the time you try to laugh it off. Hey, don't be silly. I'm not being silly. I'm being very practical. I want to get out of here. Neither one of you is going to stop me. Ed, be quiet. What? Rachel. I thought she was asleep. Rachel, don't you see it? I see you making a fool of yourself. It must be them. Who else can it, it be? It could easily be me. It could be you. Me? How could it be me? Do I want us to stay here in this madhouse? You've hated this house from the first. That's why you've spent so much money on it. That's why we've almost crippled ourselves. Always the most modern and the most expensive of everything. It's like a whipping boy. A way of punishing yourself. That's not true, Rachel. I didn't see it at the beginning, but it became obvious after a while. You didn't want a cottage in the country. So you bought the most dilapidated one we could find. You felt uneasy about your own comfort, so you turned it into a show place. You felt ashamed of spending so much money, so you jumped at every opportunity of spending more. You're still not at ease here, so you keep inviting people down in the hope that they'll convince you. Don't say any more. Now your own guilt tells you it must be your fault. Punishment inflicted on all of us because of you. But you can't bear that, so you lose your temper and turn on your friends. No. It's very simple and rather sad to someone who loves you. Do you really think of me like that? I understand you. I know how real it is and how much it hurts. But I can't let you make a fool of yourself by savaging our friends. What can I say? <laughs> but there's no need to worry. No offence taken. We can truthfully say, I think, that we are all under some strain. We should leave one another alone. We've done nothing. What? It's not what we've done. What we are. What do you mean by that? What we are. I ought to apologise. We we'll take it as red. I suppose I knew I had all that inside me. I'm horrified. It came out so viciously. Oh, for God's sake, don't be horrified. Self-flagellation is a very overrated pastime, particularly the mental kind. Some people are born with it, I think. Everyone thinks vicious thoughts about their friends. It's one of the things friends are for. Yeah, for instance, our jealousy, as you were showing us around this space, was so overwhelming, it must have been almost tangible. I felt bright green. I don't. Here am I, I was thinking, having sold out every shred of integrity and talent years ago, and here's Ed, still fighting grim battles with his conscience. And he lives like this while I keep down in a kind of intellectual rout and house. <laughs> I feel a bit like Faris being told that Helen of Troy's gone back to her husband and all the kingdoms of the earth have become republics. <laughs> I envy you your ability to joke about it. Rachel? It's a mark of the useless intellect, Ed, the unemployed mind. 
It searches for the amusing angle on everything because it is nothing better to do. Rachel, are you all right? No, I don't think so. What? Look at her. What's the matter? She's very pale and soaking wet. I feel so hot. I can't breathe. All right. Darling, let take deep breaths. I can't. I can't breathe. Oh, my God. Damn, get a glass of yeah, water. Yeah, it's so hot. Oh, I think she's going to faint. Hold on, darling. There's a drink coming. Here, here. But don't uh, pour it all over I her. I can't help it. She's gone. She's flat out. Richard, just a minute. No, 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 it's no good. She's right out. She's gone completely limp. Is it a faint? It looked like a faint, hot and short of breath. Rachel? Oh, Rachel? That won't do. She's really out. Hang on. What? I've got some smelling salts in my bag. I didn't know you carried smelling salts. What a sweet, old-fashioned thing to do. For all our friends, when you bore them into insensibility. Mmm, <laughs> oh. oh, she really is out. Smelling salts usually do the trick. If it is a faint... She should be coming round by now. She looks more like sleep. Her breathing is very quiet. Listen. Very audible. I can still feel it, though. Not deep, but regular. Do you think she's all right? I don't know. It's very odd. Oh, my God. I think she's dying. Dying? Breathing. It feels very faint now. Lay her down quickly. Lay her flat. <laughs> Rachel! Don't panic. Just get her as comfortable as possible. What on earth can have happened to her? Could it be a heart attack, a stroke? I don't think so. She didn't say anything about pain, and her colour was all wrong for a heart attack. She's breathing perfectly well now. You get close and listen. It's faint, but perfectly regular. Yes. So is her pulse, too. Feel. Oh, my God, what's happened to her? I don't think she's ill. Look at her. She's fast asleep, that's all. Flat out to the world. It must be a nervous reaction of some kind. She looks perfectly peaceful now. Except... What? None of these things are natural, are they? Well, I don't know about that. Oh, come on, Margaret. You've been tying your mind in knots trying to think of a rational way out when it gets clearer and clearer that there isn't one. And if it's not rational, what then? Then this is a part of it, too. Perhaps it's the beginning. The beginning of what? Which of us will feel short of breath next and then go unconscious all in a few seconds? Who will be the third one? And what will the last one do with three of us sleeping and only himself or herself awake? Oh, that's absurdly melodramatic. No, it isn't. And don't you feel a kind of terror closing in? Like ice building up all around us? Ed... You have a talent for histrionics that has lain dormant all these years. But it's perfectly plain what has happened. Rachel, after a period of high nervous excitement, including a row with you, has fallen into a deep and refreshing sleep and jolly good luck to her. It ought to be perfectly possible to wake her up, then, by shaking her or shouting in her ear. No, no, I wouldn't do that. Why not? Uh, it's always bad to startle people from sleep like that. If it is sleep. Well, I think we're all becoming victims of Ed's obsessions. When I said that, you laughed at me. I don't mean supernaturally, Ed. Nothing could be more prosaic. Fathers and sons. All those inherited burdens we carry to the graveside, then pass on to our children with a wicked little smile. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you've got your old man shut up in a cupboard somewhere, and he's putting the evil eye on us till you let him out. Is it me, then? All this? Have I, have no, I done it? No, you haven't, my dear man, and that's the point. Margaret and myself, you see, being of the most crystalline and unclouded conscience, we tend to assume the best, not the worst. Which is why I suggest you stop lacerating yourself and just let things happen for a bit. Regard them with appreciation or amazement, but don't necessarily assume they're directed personally at you. And now I have a quite revolutionary suggestion to make. What? Let's all go to bed. Then when we wake up, it'll be Boxing Day morning and we can all have a huge breakfast because by then we'll be starving. Dan, that is a very good idea. It's like marital rows or worries about your career. When they happen in the middle of the night, ignore them because it all looks quite different in the morning. So, where shall we sleep? You can, if you like. I'll stay here with Rachel. Well, I certainly don't intend to sleep upstairs, Ed. Because of the room? What? Where Rachel saw the child. Oh, no, I've forgotten that. No, it'll be freezing cold up there without the central heating. It's getting cold enough down here. We'll make up a marital couch by the fire, shall we, darling? It'll be like returning to my earliest youth. I had my first meaningful experiences on hearth rugs. Not with me, you didn't. You were still at school. So was I, come to that. Where are the blankets, Ed? They're in the room, too. There's a built-in blanket cupboard opposite the bed. Well, if you don't mind me pinching a candle, I'll go up and get them. Shall I come with you? No, if I want any help, I'll call you. 
to carry the blankets, I mean. <laughs> ah, Margaret's as tough as old boots, you know. That's why I adore her. Rachel's still asleep? Exactly the same. Strange, but very sensible in the circumstances. I wonder if she's dreaming. It'd have to be pretty exotic to cap this. You're right about me, Dan. And Rachel, of course. Right about what? The legacy I get from my father. Not only you. It's a bit much to be loaded with a Puritan conscience when you're not a Puritan. Oh, my dear man, half the population could say the same thing. They all proclaim their intellectual freedom and moral liberty. And just behind their shoulder comes this grim-faced chap with a black hat and white collar. Where's yours, then? In my case, he shriveled. You need to preserve some moral sense or the poor bugger starves to death. I don't believe you. Look, don't deceive yourself into thinking that I'm very good-hearted under this glittering exterior. I tried to comfort myself with that thought till I was nearly 30. I was preserving my real and worthwhile self to blossom in middle age. Now I'm on the verge of middle age, I find there's nothing left to blossom with. The bud has gone rotten and the whole tree is dying from the root. That's just self-dramatization. Uh, maybe. But she knows me. All my evasions and self-deceptions. Even if I hide them from myself, I can't hide them from her. All this, for instance. It's wrong. I know that. All what? The house. Me. Us. Ah. I know what price the rest of the world pays for our comfort. And how many thin Africans it takes to make one overweight Englishman. And that knowledge is the beginning of damnation. Fruitless, Ed. Fruitless luxury. Luxury? You don't intend to do anything about it any more than anyone else does. Agonizing over it gives you the double satisfaction of feeling bad about it and feeling good about feeling bad, both at the same time. Yes, that's right too, I suppose. Of course it's right. With all damn hands of these games with conscience, our generation, we grew up with them. But I'm also good at my job. Very good at it. I make a lot of money and I'm capable of making a lot more. And why the hell shouldn't I? There are enough incapable people in the world, but I am not one of them. I can cope. Now, now. What? Not content with being the big bad wolf, you want to be the ogre that eats children as well. Forget it. Have a drink. Yes, I think I will. The brandy is very reliable, smooth and strong and uncompromised, like me. Are you frightened, Dan? Terrified, my dear. I'm keeping my aplomb, that's all. <sighs> Every now and then I get a great surge of feeling that everything must be all right. The doors are open and we imagined it all. <laughs> Standing here talking to you, it's very hard to believe any of it happened. Try the red wine. I no, I can't do that. Then we'd better assume everything did. What will happen to us? I don't choose to think about that. I'm a slave to experience, Ed, a creature of the present moment. It's the only way life can be made endurable. Otherwise, it consists of nothing but regrets over the past and apprehensions about the future. Who wants to live like that? No one. That's right. No one. When I won my scholarship, my dad said to me, Eddie, my son, your father was born and brought up in a slum street in the East End, and he's wasted his life in dirty factories making other people rich. And now you're going to Oxford. Through you, son, and others like you, the working class will come to power. Yeah. Even at 18, I didn't know where to look. Yeah. Sounds like she made it. Hello, darling. All well? Yes, all well. How's Rachel? Just the same. Here, take these. My arms are breaking. Good God, your hands. What? They're freezing like ice. Yes, of course they are. It's cold up there. It was shaking or shaking like a leaf. All right, then I'm shaking. What happened? Nothing happened. I got cold. I think something did. All right. I was scared out of my wits. Are you satisfied? But, but nothing happened. I saw nothing. I touched nothing. Nothing happened. But you were scared. <sighs> that was my own fault. My imagination running riot. That's all. And why the hell can't we be adding machines? Just get the facts and store them and that's that. Why the hell do we have to dramatize everything? Tell me, darling. It was nothing. I was alone in the dark. There were shadows and noises and I was scared. Noises? What noises? Breathing. Breathing noises. It was me, obviously. I was listening to my own breathing and it frightened me. 
tell us what happened. I just went upstairs to get the blankets. The candle didn't throw much light, but I could see. I found the cupboard and I opened it. The bed was behind me. And then? I felt I wasn't alone. There was someone else, other people in the room, and that's when I heard the breathing coming from the bed behind me. What sort of breathing? Difficult. Laboured. It couldn't have been you, then? I turned round, and of course, there was nothing. I stood there and said to myself, All right, Margaret, this is fascinating. You're going to stare this one out, whatever it is. So I stood there with the blankets and the candle. But then... What? I had to leave. I had to get out of that room. Dear God, rather you than me. And it was my imagination, Dan. It was my imagination. What else could it be? I think that's a question we don't ask anymore. Uh, Look at Rachel. Oh, good God. She's asleep for a week. She's sitting up trying to say something. She's in agony. Oh, she's dreaming. She must be dreaming. Dreaming? Uh, what, for heaven's sake, to make her look like that? Uh, hello. I must have fallen asleep. Rachel? Oh, I'm a bit dizzy. You feel all right? Of course I feel all right. Not awake yet. You fell asleep did very I, suddenly. Did I? I don't remember. Did you dream anything? No, I don't think so. How do you feel? Not ill or anything? No. What's wrong? Why do you keep asking me questions? I feel just as I felt before, except a bit colder. I have a blanket. Blanket? Oh, we thought we might go to sleep too. It doesn't seem such a good idea now, though. Nothing's changed, has it? No, nothing's changed. No. It still feels the same. So what now? God knows. Perhaps we all go crazy. After all, what's happened? Rachel fell asleep on the sofa and I got frightened in the dark. Is there any reason for panic? There were other things, if you remember. Yes, dear, I remember. <sighs> Shall we make up this bed, then? If you like. Not in front of the fire, though. That would be a little too antisocial, even yes. for us. Just a minute. Look. What? Look at her. Rachel, what are you doing? Doing? I'm not doing anything. Walking round the room like that, touching things. Oh, am I? I didn't notice. I still feel rather dizzy, actually. Sort of claustrophobic. Claustrophobic? Shut in. I don't know. Come. Come sit down. Mm. Oh, yes. It's a good thing we've got the fire. Mm. Oh. Shut in. She can say that again. Oh, that's better. That's nice. When you were asleep, did you feel anything? I mean, did, did anything happen? What can happen when you're asleep? And you didn't dream anything? I can never, never remember dreams. I'm fine now. Just this dizziness from waking up. Oh. So there. She doesn't remember. Give in gracefully, darling. You can't expect to find a rational answer where none of the laws of reason apply. That's just an assumption on your part. <coughs> You've always been a great one for that. When you can't understand something, make an unjustified assumption and announce it as fact. Ah, that's one of the benefits of a university education. Two useful things I learned at college. Whatever you say is true if you say it authoritatively enough. And don't worry if you haven't read the books everyone's talking about because they haven't read them either. Dan, we're in trouble, aren't we? It really hit me upstairs in the room. I have been to better Christmas parties, certainly. I've been to worse, too, now I come to think of it. Ah, shall I tell you one of the things I love about you? Tell me more than one. You're relentless. Most people know when to stop, but you just plough on. Is that a virtue? Tonight it is. Stop thinking about it. There's nothing you can do. I can't help it. When I die, I'd hate to be drugged into insensibility, however painful it is. I shall want to know. George Orwell said it's best to die in your boots. But he didn't. No. You feel better now. I wonder how long we'll have to wait. Wait? What for? I don't know, but I'm sure we're waiting for something. Do you feel responsible? In general, or today? Over all this. How can I when I don't know what it is? I don't. Ed sees the fate of the whole universe depending on whether or not he's saved, but I've always been convinced of my own innocence. <laughs> I hope you don't go to heaven. I shall miss you. Oh, you're not one of the goats, Dan. You've never done anything positive enough for hell. Oh, there I must disagree with you. I'm sure the cabinet posts in the Great Republic of the Damned are held by the Stalins and Hitlers, and that the murderers, liars and betrayers make a very efficient civil service. But your average goat, the rank and file of the underworld, 
I'm pretty sure that he's made up of shallow non-entities like me. Don't say that. People say that self-knowledge is the greatest virtue. But they always assume that when you make a thorough search of yourself, you're bound to come up with something interesting. Great wickedness or sanctity or talent. It takes real self-knowledge to recognise that you're just mediocre. But you don't feel strongly enough to get out of your chair about anything. The question is, is it my fault? Or have I been dumped in a world where there's nothing left for an honest man to feel strongly about? <laughs> ah, there's a shallow question for you. Give me time and I'll think of a suitably shallow answer. Do you feel deeply about me? I can't answer that. If you're not good, Dan, you can't just sit here doing nothing. You can't do it, I can, perfectly easily. Now, wouldn't it be lovely if the lights just came on without any warning? Then we could all just sit down and eat our Christmas dinner. Incidentally, is anybody at all hungry? No. no. We ought to be by now, whatever time it is. I was starving just before we sat down. Why not try it again? What? The turkey. We've all been sitting here waiting for something to happen. Perhaps it's wearing off. Do you fancy a toast? Uh, not much, do you? Don't worry, my two heroes. I'm quite willing. But if I collapse groaning again, I shall expect you to pick me up. Margaret, are you sure? For experimental reasons, if no other. Ah. There. A rather succulent piece of breast. Well? Mm. Mm. Very nice. No pains? No pains at all. I'm not hungry enough to enjoy it, but it tastes good. Did we dream it all then? No, it, before it happened, this time it didn't. What does it mean? It might mean that whatever was happening isn't happening anymore. And that we can get out? But what are you waiting for? Do you want me to try all the doors and windows too? Come on, back door first. Margaret. What? Come here. Come here. What, what's the matter? I don't know what's happening to me. At one moment I feel myself and then... What? I can't say what it is, but it's something other. I feel it in my body. Something's coming. What do you mean, something coming? Something's coming here. All right, then. Let's try upstairs. I don't think so, Edmund. It frightens me. I can't control it. Listen, Rachel, when you woke up, what happened? I felt dizzy. I had to get out of there. There was no room. No room? Oh, yes. Something's happening now, Margaret. Whatever it is, it's beginning. I'll tell you what happened, Rachel. You sat up on this sofa and you looked terrified. What was happening to you? What were you feeling or seeing? It was horrible. I couldn't stay in that room. I had to get out. What room? You were sitting here. Well, that's that, then. But there's still the front door and the windows. The windows are just the same. Look, the black as whatever it is up there. No way out. No, my darling, no way out. Oh, God, there must be something we can do. Something's happening to Rachel. I don't know what it the is. The question is, do I care anymore? Wait a minute. I've just remembered something. What? The photos, the photos I took of the I house. Don't think I'm very interested in photos just now. If it's something to do with the house, where did I put them? No, don't look. Leave them alone. Two sets we took, as it was before we started and as it is now. Photos of the house? Darling, where the hell are they? It's coming closer. I can feel it. It's almost here. Who's Dan? Help me. Then two separate photos. What is it, Rachel? What's coming nearer? I can't explain. It's in my stomach. Tell me. Try to tell me. Here they are. Two packets of prints. What is it that's coming? Where is it coming from? Yes, it's here. Here in the house. What? Uh, those are the before ones. You see, that's how it was. The metals and the fat all rotted and overgrown. <gasps> the choice has been made, and now it's beginning to work. What choice? What has been chosen? Us. The four of us. We have been chosen. Oh, my God. Look at this one. And this. These should be the modernised pictures. They're not. No. Dan, I didn't take these pictures. Even the landscape looks different. The trees are in different places. It's almost as if... And this one, look... That large house in the background, about a mile and a half from the cottage. That's the hall. Same as in the print you gave us. I thought you said... It was pulled down in 1921. God, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. What, Rachel? Look, 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 that's the cottage. Yes, it? but different. There's someone at the window. It's a woman. A dark-haired woman with a shawl. Yes, a dark-haired woman with a thin face and a shawl. How does she know? 
Rachel! She's doing it again. Moving around the room. Touching things. Walls. Don't say anything. Just watch. First, I must describe my situation. The cottage is more than a hundred years old and needs repairing. When the rain is very heavy or goes on for a long time, the thatch leaks or becomes soggy and everything is damp for days. The walls are lath and plaster and badly decayed. The plaster has crumbled in some places and you can see daylight through the slats. I try to cover those places with sacking as I do the windows. There has been no glass in them for as long as I can remember. Where does she mean? Here, surely. How can she mean here? My own position is desperate. But I try to keep my mind clear as far as I can in my fevered condition, but the pain in my stomach is mostly very bad and sometimes reduces me to screaming and groans when I can do nothing but despair. For myself, I suppose I could bear it more easily, but when the children cry out and moan and beg me for food, I feel I will run mad with anger and bitterness. It brings murder into my heart, and if I could, and it would help them, I would willingly do it. But what can I do now? Nothing. I can do nothing at all. Dear God, she's in such pain. There's nothing we can do, just watch. Oh, no, there's nothing more to be done now. Nothing more now. Just the waiting and the pain. The children have cried themselves to sleep and we are all too weak to move anymore. I can only sit here talking to the walls and wondering how long it will be. What children? Just listen. Go on, Rachel. We can all hear. If I could write. I would put it all down in a book so that the whole world should know what they've done to us. But no one bothers to teach the poor. So even that comfort is denied me. But I have to speak. I have to make it known, even if only to the bare wall. Who is it speaking? I don't know. Just listen. I, Sarah Jane Mulby, born a Christian, age 26, a married woman, but now a widow. I'm lying here on a straw mattress with my two children, Robert and Jane. There is a little water, but nothing to eat. We have none of us eaten for well over a week at least. I don't remember when. Here, in this house. Listen. My husband, Robert, was a hard-working man, not sparing himself when there was farm work or anything else to be done, and we were all happy till the bad times came. The people had to leave for the town, and many houses in the village stood empty. There was no trade and no work till bread became too dear to buy, and then there was none at all to be had. The squire told us that there was no more work, and we must spend for ourselves, and the parson told us to pray to God. We did pray. We prayed to him day and night, but the food got less and less, and my husband was in despair. He took to going out at night, and some nights he'd bring back a rabbit or a hen or even a lamb one time, and we managed to live for several months that way. But the gamekeepers got stricter. A man in the next village was hanged, and there was no more game to be had, with half the country living on it. A man came one night, a stranger with a book in his hand, and he talked to Robert till dawn. They spoke angrily and cried out so that I heard it, and the children stirred in their sleep. Then the next night, Robert went out with the man and some others, and he didn't come back the next morning. And I heard that there were fires in the fields. The ricks were burning, and the squire's barn had been burned down, and that my Robert had been taken by the soldiers. Rachel, darling. No, you must let her finish. I went to the assizes. I saw my Robert in the dock with the other men, looking pale and ill. I was praying for transportation, but it was death. I cried out to the judge that we were all starving. 
And what were we expected to do without food? But the judge spoke grandly about property and rights, and I was dragged from the court. I took the two children to see their father hanged. I told them to remember what was done to him so that they should grow up to avenge his death on all the wicked men responsible. But that will never happen now. A doctor told me it takes 20 minutes for a hanging man to die. I stood there all the time without taking my eyes off his poor face, giving him all my love to help him bear that terrible death. He moved a little at first, but gradually became still. But I waited over half an hour to be quite sure. None of us cried. Not even the children. Barbarians. Barbarians. That evening I tried to see the squire, but they chased me away and said my husband was a criminal. I crept round the side of the house, hoping to go in and tell the squire of my children's hunger and ask for his mercy. When I got to the window, I could see them at the table. The squire was there, and his brother, the parson, and his sons. There was a side of beef and several roast chickens and cakes and pies and bottles of red wine. And in the corner, the squire's daughter was playing music, a sweet, melancholy tune, while my husband lay dead and my children were crying for food. And I thought this can never be forgiven. No circumstances, no degree of self-interest, not even ignorance can ever excuse this feasting and dancing while on the same planet, in the same village, people are starving. And I knew then that I was beaten, that where there was no conscience, there was no hope that there was nothing to be done, that this wickedness and injustice was too great a monster for me to grapple with. I came home and closed the door, and since that day no one has bothered to open it again to see who may be inside. Here she means. She means here. I used to believe in God, but this world is men's work. I recognize it by the bloodstains. If God still sees us, he sees us with despair. Like Pilate, he shakes his head and washes his hands, unable to save us. I know we will soon be dead now. The worst pain is over, and my bodily weakness is almost comforting, like the beginning of sleep. I have no forgiveness for the selfishness and greed which has destroyed my family. The hardest thing of my dying is to know that our murderers will go unpunished. Someone surely must pay for our unjust deaths and all the other deaths like ours, for I know we are not unique. If no ear can hear my accusations, nor no eye ever read them, let my words burn themselves into the fabric of these walls, so that brickwork and plaster and beams should remember the agony and injustice of those dying under this roof. How can this ground ever be easy while there is no atonement for crimes like these? The soil is 
bitter with my children's blood. I can't say any more. Just this cry against injustice from the dark centuries. Jane is dead now, and Robert is in a deep sleep from which he will never wake. I can't speak any more. I shall need all my breath to face this starvation that is slowly draining my life. While we sleep in our pauper's graves, let someone, somewhere, remember... Us. A chosen form. <gasps> Rachel! Is she all right? She's dead. No, she isn't. She's still breathing. Rachel, my darling, are you all right? We must put out all the candles. Why? Put out all the candles and go upstairs. Why upstairs, Rachel? Because she's there, lying on a straw mattress with her two children, where our bed used to be under the cracked walls and the leaking roof, with mice running between her feet. The children are stiff and still, with their fragile bones protruding, and their skin like paper. She's half sitting up against the wall. She wouldn't die on her back. Her eyes are open, and the expression on her face is not an expression of peace. Follow me. Shall we go? I don't think we have any choice. Hold my hand, Dan. I'm frightened. Don't be afraid. I told you we were privileged. Yes, and I understand it now. Now, I understand it. speaking at a UNESCO conference in Paris has called for a radical heart searching on the part of the developed countries. It is well known, he said, that under the present circumstances, far from rectifying the situation, the rich countries are getting richer and the poor countries are getting poorer. How much longer are we prepared to let this situation continue, he asked the assembled delegates. Finally, News is just coming in of a bizarre Christmas tragedy. In a remote country cottage, four apparently healthy people in their late thirties have been found dead. An air of mystery surrounds the story at the moment, said a spokesman at Scotland Yard. But foul play is not suspected. The four bodies, when found, were in an extremely emaciated condition. And although the house was full of food and drink, and a sumptuous Christmas dinner was laid on the table, almost untouched, all four people appeared to have died of starvation. In The Exorcism, the part of Edmund was played by Kenneth Haig, Dan by Norman Rodway, Margaret by Sarah Kesselman, and Rachel by Susan Fleetwood. Music was by Herbert Chappell. The play was adapted for radio and directed by Don Taylor.